morning, colleagues. All right, I have been given the go ahead to start our meeting. So, welcome to today's meeting. It is such a pleasure to have you all here. Let me get started with the, my notes though. To say, I would like to inform you all that this meeting is being interpreted in English, Spanish, French, and Portuguese. To access the interpretation, please select the globe icon and choose English. Esta reunión tiene interpretación en español, inglés, francés y portugués. Para esa, uh, acceder a la interpretación, les invitamos a seleccionar el icono del mundo y elegir el idioma español. La reunión es interpretada en francés, español, anglais y portugués. Pour accéder à l'interprétation, nous vous invitons à sélectionner l'image du globe et choisir le français. Esta réunion uh, tiene interprétation en espagnol, anglais, français et portugais. Para accéder, convidamos vous à sélectionner o icône du globe à bas, escolaire ou idioma portugais. I will now switch to English as that's what I speak best and you will all have interpretation to help follow me along before we start. Thank you to our interpreters for allowing us to have this meeting in these four languages. This is the plenary session of the fifth Parlamerica's Parliamentary Network on Climate Change, uh, uh, or the fifth gathering of the, the Parlamerica's Parliamentary Network on Climate Change. And it's organized in collaboration with the Parliament of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago and the Senate of Mexico. We are grateful if you could, as you get settled into the meeting, to please uh, uh, make sure your name is... Nope, we're not hearing, all right. Colleagues, could you please confirm for me that the interpretation is working? Yes, I have a thumbs up on Portuguese, uh, Spanish. Thank you, Senator. All right, I'm going to proceed. Um, grateful if you can please ensure that your name is written correctly. Uh, if you can include that you're a, a senator or a parliamentarian or your country, this will help us later on in the dialogue. So now, without further ado, I wish to invite Senator Nancy de la Sierra from the Senate of Mexico, Secretary of the Senate, a board and president of the Special Committee on Monitoring of the Implementation of the 2030 Agenda, to please give us welcome remarks on behalf of the Senate of Mexico. Senator de la Sierra, the floor is yours. Thank you, as usual, it is a pleasure to see you distinguished parliamentaries, the team from Parliamericas and the representatives of the civil organization welcome from Mexico. It is a pleasure to welcome you all and to have this uh, meeting at a distance to work on this plenary session that has us here. With the President of the Senate, the Senator Eduardo Ramirez Aguilar, please have a warm welcome. For the Chamber of Senators of Mexico, it is a pleasure to co-lead these meetings of the fifth encounter of the Parliamentary Network of Climate Change of Parliamericas, tackling the inequalities to work with the climate session with a, a just transition to have the Paris Agreement along with the Parliament of Trinidad and Tobago. And also I have to talk about my representation to the Trinita representatives and the representative Jeanette Z. York, co-host of the fifth encounter that without a doubt is going to be a huge success even with the condition of pandemic that we have. Thank you so much for this on the national encounters of all the continents. And also I want to acknowledge the role of the parliamentary network that from 2016 has worked intensely and in a decided manner to fight against the climate change for the environment and sustainable development of Americas. Also want to congratulate the members of the civil society and the representatives of the youth organizations that work in an enthusiastic manner and that joined for all these sessions, these prior sessions, interesting points of view. These elements are telling us that 
the relevance of working together, the society and the government to find alternatives that can be promoted with the legislative powers and to contribute to a more inclusive and solid uh, answer to the climate change phenomenon that as we have seen in our uh, uh, conversation is one of the largest challenges that all the countries and sectors have, but with larger impact for the most vulnerable population. At the same time, it has been a show of the commitment of all the networks working with interested parties on the mitigation and adaptation of the climate change via a constructive dialogue. As a short summary of the prior interventions of day 4th and 15th of June, Mexican Senate, we work on the concern that we had on the legislator Anisad York concerning that there are still negationist stance on the climate change, despite the degradation of the ecosystems and the loss of biodiversity in the global terms. Even their uh, the OECD have talked about this challenge as the huge, as largest threat for the man, uh, humankind and along with the sanitary emergency that we have. So as we have been able to show in the first meeting, one of the main and uh, most meaningful elements that we have had on this tenure on the 64th was the approval and ratification of this Kisu agreement with which we can see the uh, commitment of Mexico with a public participation and access to justice in environmental terms, essential elements on the on the fight against climate change. And we know that these uh, element is uh, particularly important for members of the civil society, as it counts with the specific dispositions that guarantee a safe environment for the different environment defenders. Uh, There's a huge challenge for our region where we have to continue working, also to work with the people and the people in vulnerability situations. This agreement is is unique along the world and an important uh, challenge to continue with the governance and environmental justice in our region. Now, in terms of the Paris Agreement, all the countries that are here are part of these that has become one of the multilateral tools that are more important in the last years in climate terms to revert reverse the, cha the challenge of the climate change. But it hasn't been enough. And then going to the next uh, commitment of climate change on the COP26 that is going to be held in Glasgow on November 2021, uh, number that is going to coincide with the Paris Accord is going to be an essential element to have new consensus that take us to our firmer agreements and more decided in the fight against climate change as it has been reiterated in many uh, uh, situations by the General Secretariat of the United Nations, Antonio Gutierrez, the climate change has to be considered as a priority in the international agenda. And currently the sanitary crisis has, tell, has told us that we have to change our relation with nature. In this way, as it has happened uh, with the prior changes, it's important to need to move to sustainable uh, elements that work that vouch for the environment, along with the carbon, the use of clean energy, and the change both of the production types and the, our consumption habits. Within the context of the crisis generated by the COVID-19, if we have an opportunity to have a sustainable recovery that is inclusive and resilient as well, aligned with the 2030, uh, in 10 years to reach the final part uh, to reach the sustainable development goals for the people and the planet. Now, considering the different challenges that we have in this global part, this is taking us for the participation and the wellness of all the members of the planet, especially our vulnerable groups and the youth, kids, youth and others that are representing not only our future, but also our present. Even though the COVID-19 pandemic has been one of the challenges with most indications in terms of public health, public and social health in the last times, I am convinced that if we take advantage of this moment to transform our world, are working about our commitment with the multilateralism and international cooperation adversities, can be overcome. And this uh, is helping us for the look of solutions that help us with this purpose. For that reason, it is essential to multiply the joint work that takes the states, the parliaments, the academia, civil society, including youth uh, in the same line of ODS 17 and alliances to reach 
these uh, elements where we are creating synergies and strategies, especially to reach the uh, reduction of carbon emission and to go with the threat that we have now. As legislators, we have the obligation, we have the duty to know that the fight against the climate change is something that we cannot take behind. So climate change and the change of the legislation that we have and the different transition processes that we have to green resilient economies and zero emissions has to be a priority in each one of our Congresses. So I finish uh, concluding that in the different work sessions that have been part of this encounter of the parliamentary network of Parliamericas. We have had the opportunity of exchanging different points of view, knowing different experiences and different concrete actions for the mitigation and adaptation of the climate phenomenon. I trust then that what we have learned has been helpful for the practice in our countries and the bonds that we have created in our networks can be continued so that we can continue working hand in hand with different parliamentaries on the work that we do. So to wrap up with this session, this helps us that in any moment we can uh, talk again about, reiterate about our responsible and inclusive work. So please count with the commitment of the Senate of the Republic of Mexico to continue working with the protection of the environment and the wellness of people so that together we can manage that uh, Americas are a sustainable region for our present and our future generations where nobody's left behind. Thank you so much for allowing me to say these words. Thank you very much, Senator. It's such a pleasure to have Mexico co-host this meeting with us uh, today. And now I would love to invite uh, the Honorable Bridget Anisette George of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, the co-host for today's session, to give some welcome remarks on behalf of the Parliament. Uh, Speaker Anisette George, I pass the floor to you. The microphone, the Zoom world to you. Thank you so much, Director General. Senator the Honorable Christine Kangaroo, President of the Senate of the Parliament of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. The Honorable Eduardo Ramirez, President of the Senate of the United Mexican States. Senator Blanca Ovilar, President of Parliamericas. Members of Parliament of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. Members of the Congress of the Union of the United Mexican States. Ambassador Luis Alfonso de Alba. Special Envoy of the United Nations Secretary General for the 2019 Climate Summit. The Honorable Carolyn Trench Sandiford, President of the Senate of Belize. Senator Katia Abu, President of the Committee on Foreign Relations and National Defense of Brazil. Senator the Honorable Rosa Galvez, Vice President of Parliament Americas, Parliament Network on Climate Change for North America. The Honorable Ivan Flores, Member of the Chamber of Deputies and former President of the Chamber of Deputies of Chile, Member of the Legislative Assembly, Paolo Vega of Costa Rica, Mr. Rafael Jimenez Aiba, Environmental Democracy, Democracy Advisor, Westminster Foundation for, no for Democracy, Special Observers, Legislative and Parliament, Parliamerica staff, good morning. That was a mouthful. In my capacity of Vice President of Parliamericas and as Speaker of the House of Representatives of Trinidad and Tobago, it is a pleasure to welcome you to the plenary session of the fifth gathering of Parliament, America's Parliamentary Network on Climate Change, entitled Addressing Inequalities to Enable Climate Ambition. In opening the session, I wish to recognize Madam President of Parliamericas, Blanca Ovilar, for her leadership in ensuring that Parliamericas continues to be the dynamic hemispheric organization that it is in the promotion of parliamentary democracy and training in pertinent issues for legislators and by extension, all of society. I must also express my gratitude to the Senate of Mexico which has so graciously co-hosted this gathering with the Parliament of Trinidad and Tobago, a partnership which so aptly demonstrates that it is in collaborating on our commonalities and not fighting over our differences that we develop each other's greatest potential. It is also a distinct honor for me to particularly welcome on behalf of all of us, Ambassador Luis Alfonso de Alba, 
Special Envoy to the United Nations Secretary General for the 2019 Climate Summit, who has so generously given up his time to join us and is our key note speaker today. Our participation in this gathering demonstrates that we accept the view of the Swedish climate change activist, Greta Thunberg, that there is a shared duty and responsibility to act in response to climate change. However, Ms. Thunberg has lamented that, and I quote, adults keep saying we owe it to young people to give them hope. But in her view, hope is fickle. She wants us to act and act as we would in any other crisis, end quote. That lament is not unique to Ms. Thunberg. It can be considered a universal cry of youth and climate experts about leaders, policymakers, and legislators. Yes, that cry is about us legislators. To be fair, as legislators, we know that climate change is a reality, having witnessed its effects on our constituents. Time on our that there is a climate a crisis, and urgent action is required to change that universal, reach that universal goal set by the Paris Agreement in 2015, that the global average temperature will not rise above 1.5 degrees Celsius of pre industrial levels by 2030. So why then should we be accused of not acting as if we recognize that there's a crisis? Admittedly, while there has been progress, climate experts say that the progress has not been adequate to reach the universal goal. Youth and civil society say that we must include them in the formulation of our policies and plans as climate change affects everyone in every aspect of life. And in excluding them, our plans may not only fail to address the crisis of climate change, but our plans in themselves may cause greater harm and disadvantages to our constituents. In the previous sessions held during this gathering, we received presentations from subject matter experts on the importance of developing not just short, and long-term climate plans, but that our plans must be inclusive and intersectional in their design. Our plans must be founded on gender-based approaches. Our plans must have arrived at in a fully democratic way. We also had the opportunity to interact and have exchanges with civil society and youth organizations from the Americas and the Caribbean to explore the ways in which legislators could increase their participation in our legislative work on climate change and climate action. It is evident that climate change and climate action demand the participation of all society and of all nations. It undeniably poses an existential risk to the world. We have seen that stakeholders in industry and academia are collaborating in achieving innovations which would result in the mitigation of their greenhouse gas emissions in their productive processes. While we celebrate those initiatives, as legislators, we must also be aware of the relationship between climate change and social inequality. The most disadvantaged and vulnerable suffer disproportionately from the impacts of climate change, and they are also less likely to cover from its effects and therefore they become more vulnerable and more disadvantaged with each climate impact. Therefore, our policies must address all inequalities and ensure that while industry and academia address greenhouse gas emissions and design systems, plants, machinery, and production to greener and cleaner, the changes do not exacerbate the inequalities which exist in our societies. The International Labour Organization notes that a shift to greener economies could create 24 million new jobs globally by 2030 if the right policies are effective. Let us vow that by our work, the disadvantaged and vulnerable in our societies will be included in and benefit from 
those new jobs. The objective of this gathering could not therefore be more timely as it focuses us on the issues of inequalities and climate change and shall provide us with practices and tools to employ in the creation of inclusive and just climate plans and policies. We are well aware of our goal, greener, cleaner, and zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. We also appreciate that our respective societies are unique, geographically, de developmentally, economically, culturally, and in their social construct. And therefore, while we may have varying country-specific plans and policies to reach that universal goal, we must also be guided by the fundamental principles of intersectionality and gender-based approaches. There already exist several international agreements and instruments with which we must get familiar and utilize to inform our legislative work, such as the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, the Silesia De Declaration on Solidarity and Just Transition, the Convention of the United Nations to Combat Decertification, the Convention on Biological Diversity, the Escazú Agreement, and the Declaration on Children, Youth, and Climate Action. We must accept that in our roles as representatives, we have a duty to call upon our governments which have not yet signed those agreements to do so. In our work on climate change, we must keep ever prevalent the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change and the Paris Agreement, which contain important provisions for developing states related to securing financial support to implement our national commitments. To my parliamentary colleagues from the Americas and the Caribbean, parliamentary clerks, representatives of youth organizations, and civil society who have steered the course of this gathering with us. I hope this plenary session further motivates us to persist in the battle against climate change, and that we leave here with a better understanding of the practices and tools which can make what appears to be a daunting assignment a realizable one. I'm convinced that our greatest contribution and our most significant legacy will be to take the necessary political decisions, however difficult and challenging they may seem, to pave the way to a more inclusive, democratic, just, and sustainable rule. I thank you for joining us this morning, and I wish us all a productive session. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. With that, we will now transition to uh, Senator Blanca Ubala, President of Parle Americas, who will close out our opening uh, ceremony here. Senator Ovela, I pass to you. Muchas gracias. Muy buenos días a todos. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning to all of you. I'm really happy of being able to participate in this great encounter. On behalf of Parle Americas, please, all of you have my warmest regards for joining us in this uh, plenary session of the fifth encounter of the Parliamentary Network of Climate Change of Parle Americas, named tackling inequalities to foster the climate mission uh, just transition to have the Paris Agreement. The Senate from Mexico that has hosted this series of lectures. I kindly welcome the, his honorable Luis Alfonso de Ama, who's a special joint officer from the from this parliamentary office to discuss the climate change who is going to lecture us in this meeting in this gathering thank you very much to all of the legislators the parliamentarians and all of the different officers that 
are working with us in a specialized way. And also the youth from Latin America and the Caribbean, as they have helped us and supported us within these meetings. For Parla Americas and the Network for Climate Change, it is key to offer this kind of spaces to discuss the issues that are important to all of us so we can establish the best practices regarding the issues that we have at hand for the global agenda in order to mitigate the different effects of the climate change. That is why this kind of spaces is inspiring in such way that we can call on different people on, coming from different fields, such as specialists or different stakeholders. That is the way that we have bonded with different agencies or different organizations that work around the climate change, such as the framework, such as the framework for the climate change and the Office of the United Nations in order to avoid disasters, the OCE, UNICEF, and some others. We have also encouraged conversations with the civil society and some other organizations, environmental organizations, that can help us to understand how the civil society participation is key in order to respond to the different challenges that our population, that our people have, specifically for those most vulnerable populations that we may have historically in our different countries who have suffered the devastating effects of the climate change. We all know that they are affected the most by all of these different effects of the climate change. Within these last efforts, we have explored different options in order to address all of the different social inequalities that we may have, which is going to help us in the end to respond or to comply with the Paris Agreement. But beyond that, we need to be aware that all of these objectives are completely necessary and we need to comply with them, but we also need to be loyal to these mindset of the 2030 agenda. As we have seen throughout all of these different sessions, we have seen how important it is to establish conversations with youth population and also with the legislative bodies from the different countries in such way that we can understand how differentiated we should address this agenda so we can see all of the cultural, economic, and social differences that we have in Latin America. Because if we don't do that, we are going to have them exacerbated. Yesterday at the United Nations, they presented the report. This, it is amazing, or it is unbelievable to see the title of this, of this report which has to do with how trapped we feel within this reality that we're facing right now it can be it can be understood as if it were a trap so here we can see how concentrated the power is in some places and how violent our countries are we have eight percent we have 40 percent of the most violent deaths in our around the world there are protectionist systems that are not working well, and we have low growth with low productivity levels. So can you imagine within this level, how difficult it is to plan strategies in order to mitigate the devastating effects of the climate change? It is definitely important to focus on inequalities. This complex relationship that we have regarding all of the different issues that we may have and how they interact to each other, it has to be, first of all, recognized and acknowledged so we can start working on public policies and how they can actually face the climate change that we're going through. All of our plans have to involve intersectoral efforts and gender efforts so we can respond to these inequalities that we have within our countries and therefore we can actually address the climate change but also we 
cannot make this situation any worse because we do all know how every single decision is going to affect this. For example, with this pandemic scenario that we are in, we can see how some of the different issues that we had got exacerbated. And we knew how many different countries that were actually striving to, to get better in their countries, they actually went back in time because they lost their employment, they lost their families, and they were deeply impacted by death given the COVID-19. And unfortunately, this situation has impacted more the ones that have the, le the least. So all of the different events that happen, and especially the ones that have to do with the climate change, are deeply affecting and they're worsening the social inequalities that we have. Who are the people that lives in these places? Who do you think uh, all of these um, climate change events are going to affect? So therefore, our policies need to be responsive to this social reality that is characteristic of our region and characteristic of Latin America and the Caribbean region, because this is the second most uh, unequal region throughout the world. So we need to understand that all of our public policies have to be addressed in an inclusive way. As parliamentarian officers, we must include everyone and we are responsible. We, we must be responsible for the development and the monitoring of the compliance with this social commitment where we are looking forward to complying with the SDGs. And therefore we need to alineate and coordinate all of the different efforts from each one of our countries. That's why Parliamericas is first establishing a first draft so, so we can see how we can work together. As parliamentarians, we need to work on the de development of these commitments, of these SDG commitments from the Latin American and the Caribbean region that is going to be presented today. Within this session, we will also have the opportunity to get to know some best practices that can actually help us to improve the job we're doing in each one of our countries in such way that we have an inclusive approach to draft better bills and to include transition uh, policies in order to have a more resilient and zero emission society where that is going to help us to complete our objectives, to comply with our objectives before COP26. Finally, we will adhere to the declaration on what we are going to do in the coming years. We know that we are committed to our responsibility, responsibilities in the different scenarios that we work in. And we always adhere to different commitments and different agreements. And we're always committed to have better policies. But, in the, but whenever we talk about our agenda, it is necessary to be aware that we need to revise those commitments because otherwise they're just going to be in the paper but they must be motivational and they must inspire future generations. It is key to do so, and especially even more so, because as parliamentarians, we should be empathetic and we should be close to people and to their suffering. We should be close to the problems that affect our society and therefore the actions that we as parliamentarians take on they must be addressed to control the, all of the policies that we have and actually create new legal instruments that are actually going to help and are going to help us to come to a more equalitarian society. Last but not least, today we are going to select the new executive committee from the climate change to whom we are going to work with in such so we can continue working with this parliamentarian work that we are in charge of thank you very much um thank you for joining us today i am sure that this plenary session would be very productive and we are going to come out strengthened and this is going to give us 
to nourish us with some more new ideas in order to accept and address the new challenges that we have um, in front of us. So we want to have a more just and more fair uh, society where the suffering of the most vulnerable person has to cease. So we cannot be, we cannot look away towards this suffering. We must be the leaders that our people need us to be. Thank you very much and hope you have the best session today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Ovelar. Well, I feel that we have now before us, we're set. We know it's an important meeting. Um, it is a critically important subject right now that we need to be engaging with. Before we move into the work, I do need you to indulge me because part of this is that we are here as a group working together. So if you could please turn on your cameras, we will take our group photo. Normally I would have done this in person just so that we have a record of our solidarity from across the hemisphere. So everybody camera on, big smiles, it's not the same. My colleagues will take our picture. And this will be shared with all of you. Colleagues in charge of pictures, can you please Ready. tell me? We're good? Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for that. I wish we could have been in person, arms around each other as we had that photo. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce Ambassador Luis Alfonso de Alba. Ambassador de Alba is a friend of Parla Americas. He was the former ambassador to the OAS for Mexico. That's where we, we first got to work with the ambassador uh, many years ago. And more recently, he was the special envoy of the United Nations uh, for the United Nations Secretary General for the 2019 Climate Summit and has done a lot of work in this space. And so we are so honored to have him here provide us with keynote remark. Please, uh, Ambassador de Alba, I pass the floor to you. Thank you for being here with us today. Muy buenos días a, a todas y a todos ustedes. Thank you very much. Good morning to you all. I am honored to be with you this morning with this very important Pan-American gathering. And I'd like to start by thanking you for this invitation. So I could join you today with the parliamentarians and the legislators from Mexico and Trinidad and Tobago. I would like to start, if it's okay with you, by highlighting how serious this issue is and has been, because as we have seen by Senator De La Sierra, and Senator George Ovilar, who have actually showed us how serious this issue that we have at hand is. But I think that beyond that, it is important to recall how urgent it is to take action upon this issue we have. Because we know that this imply having a periodical revision on the different commitments and the different actions and ambitions that each one of our states, our member states have. And 2020, which meant the first formal uh, monitoring exercise and updating exercise from these uh, commitments that we have that were first drafted in 2015. As you know, last year it has to be postponed that's why this year in november we are going to sit together to actually perform this first revision and updating exercise and i think it is important to have in mind this urgency because of two different reasons the first one is that before the pandemics we know that this ambition and everything that we have said before or that had been registered in 2015, that was the time where we signed uh, this Paris Agreement, were not sufficient. And not only um, to increase this in a symbolic way, but also to multiply the different efforts that we had if we wanted to comply with the objective in order to keep uh, temperatures be to, below 1.5 uh, Celsius degrees. And 
we know that this is especially important now after all of this COVID situation, and this has been especially important for the different offices in each one of the uh, members, uh, state members, in order to remember, to recall what the commitments of the Paris Agreement were. And this is especially important in many different places because climate change is undoubtedly a serious issue that actually uh, is a, the biggest threat that we've seen in the last years and somehow it is still understood as a simple environmental issue however it must be prioritized as this has to do with poverty so we necessarily have to correct this approach and make sure that it is well understood that even though this is an existential and environmental problem, it also affects some other dimensions. And therefore, we need to find a solution in order to, to address these very issues, these very serious issues, because it is undoubtedly one of the biggest things that we need to address that goes beyond the environmental agenda. It doesn't, it doesn't have to do exclusively with the environmental agenda. And as it has been previously said, it has to do with a change in the mode in the consumption model that we have in each one of our countries so in that way if we accept this challenge this lack of ambition challenge and if we of course avoid the easy ways out we must take advantage of this opportunity in order to put together the two different agendas we have at hand the climate change agenda and the development agenda in order to actually produce a truly sustainable um, society or model. And it is essentially important because otherwise we would have an increase in the temperature in our planet and it would mean four, between four to five uh, centigrades. Celsius degrees, which is far, very far away from our objective of 1.5. So you could imagine what the results or what the outcome of such situation would be. So I think those, besides that would affect um, the response to, to what we signed in with the Paris Agreement. We wouldn't be addressing the carbon emission, and we wouldn't be addressing the temperature challenge that we take, took on some years ago. And this would even affect some other things, for example, at the regional level or local level. We should also think about um, the positive side of it. And of course, this has to do with the civil society participation. Because we have seen how civil society has become increasingly interested on these kind of issues. Although it doesn't have to do only with the central government, but also local governments in each one of our countries. But I would, I would like to address or to pay attention to the civil society that is focused on women, on um, native peoples, and different parts of the society. And of course, here we also need to acknowledge uh, the academia and the parliamentarians who have also integrated or have joined this agenda. This participation from different and new actors that have um, joined uh, these efforts in a very active and proactive way, I think it is the biggest and most important change in the last couple of years, because now there isn't only a single uh, responsible person or actor within this agenda, but this also helps us to understand what the responsibility or what the joint or shared responsibility should be like having in mind the different capacities that each stakeholder has. And here we had, this is something that we had some while ago where we thought about the developed and the non-developed countries, but now we know that this principle is shared among all of the different stakeholders and the different state members. 
and which has to do with the governmental and non-governmental entities that are part of these efforts because we know that we all want to have a better we have or we want to find a solution and we also are responsible uh, for this change in terms of action so with this first note i would like to highlight the positive aspect and on the other hand i think that in an also in a very positive way, it is important to acknowledge how we're striving to produce clean energies, not only by the private sector. And this has actually showed us how we can uh, decrease the costs of this kind of production of energy. This is something that we didn't used to have, let's say 10 years ago. I had to be in charge of the conversation that Cooper in Cancun in 2016 and or 26 i'm sorry 2006 i'm sorry uh, but we didn't knew we didn't know how expensive it was going to be but today we know that, that these expenses can be reduced if we actually take these developments these new developments these new innovation and technologies towards these specific scenarios so this is a second note on what I think is very positive and what has changed within our scenario. And lastly, I would like to address something that I think is important to understand in positive terms is that the process of the negotiation process, specifically speaking about the governments and within the framework of the United Nations is actually coming to a moment in which there are some pending issues, of course. Uh, for example, to start working with different markets and to see how we can update what the objective for the funding financing would be for the developed countries must transfer to the developing countries. And there are some pending discussions on transparency and on the revision of reports, but I think that these are issues that I would say that are minor or that I would say are minor in comparison to some others, because the focus of this agreement must be on the responsibility of each state member. And it is these nationally developed initiatives by the Oh, this is these instruments that I would like to recommend you to focus your work on. This is the way in which not only the governments have to work with, not only complying with the Paris Agreement, but you could also do it together with the business people or some other actors from the civil society where you can periodically revise and report what you are doing in order to fight this climate change. Uh, it is very interesting to see how this uh, indices is still very low in terms of compliance. And by 2020, there must have been, there must have been reviewed or there must have been proposed new indices towards COP, but actually nowadays it is very few countries who have done this. And actually there are even very few countries who have actually reviewed these guidelines, including a region, of course, where we have just two or three countries that have actually submitted some sort of contribution and who have actually provided information uh, regarding the previous ones. And this is something that we need, that we must regret because we need to work further on this kind of initiatives in order to achieve some sort of change. So coming back to what I was saying before, there are some positive signs and there are some spaces where we have built some sort of uh, partnership, public-private alliances or partnerships. And that I think is something that was um, highlighted in 2019, where we were about to go to the 2020 COP, which I think is very important. And that's why it was important to increasingly, to increase substantially 
what was going to happen. And of course, we are not going to manage to do it if we don't have more of these partnerships that I was talking about. And that's why he worked on the preparation of different initiatives in different sectors. I would highlight very quickly three or four of the areas where we had some important advances, especially on what has to do with, with energy, the energetical transition, uh, the strife against the use of carbon, and how this carbon use can be decreased. And of course, uh, the use of fossil fuels. And here I'd like to, to say that there are some important advances, some important, some important things that we need to intensify. And especially because we have seen that in, in issues that have to do with transition from these industries in order to be more efficient, and in order to reduce their emissions, we have seen some important, or well, some not very, or unequal advances, because we, we have seen how some of advances were recognized at the summit, for example, on what has to do with the sea transport, but we also have problems with the air transport because of the high levels of emissions, at least in the short term, and we need to change that, at least in the short term again. And we also saw how there are uh, solutions based on nature and how we can work on reforestation and how we can take better care of the different res natural resources we have and how these approaches become more conversation um, in order to preserve preservationist, to see how we could actually address all of these issues and how this would affect communities in the social aspect, especially for native communities or native peoples, especially what has to do with the preservation of forests. Here, I think that the integration of the agenda and the joint efforts in order to preserve biodiversity and, the, and to fight uh, climate change, and at the same time to put all of this together in the 2030 agenda, I think that we had an, a meaningful advance. Another aspect that I would say was successful, as, it, as they said during the summit, had to do with the funding and the emergence of new actors or new stakeholders, especially on what has to do with some investors with, uh, with some sovereign funding, where we have seen how they have prioritized climate change whenever they're doing their financial planning. So we can see how some different efforts have been drafted, especially by finance specialists around the world. And some of the countries that started with this process was a Latin American country, which is the, uh, the case of Chile. And here, I think that we need to pay more attention to these kind of facts, and we need to support this kind of initiatives from the, as parliamentarians, we need to support this kind of initiatives because we know that this doesn't have to do with the Ministry of Environment, but this has to do also with the finance minister or with the finance agenda in each one of the countries. And that's why we should involve even more and more uh, ministries within our offices. Among some of the things that we couldn't comply with, we would say, I would say again, that it has to do with the level of ambition, strictly, strictly speaking, in its translation into new NDCs. As I said, we are a very, we're at a very low level, and we couldn't achieve either an agenda where we had a more updated, let's say, agenda that can face the negotiation that we have at hand. Unfortunately, this cough or these differences between the stakeholders have actually disappointed the different members because we can see how much of an effort they do. And we have very good levels of participation, but we do not have or we are we fail 
in the final steps. And this is mainly due to the negotiation processes. I'm sorry to say that, because, but it is very obsolete having in mind the methodology. And this is a process that has actually opened up the way to a lack of, to some misinterpretation. And this very valuable objective that we had in mind becomes pretty much a prohibitional objective. And unfortunately, that has halted the process, the negotiation process. The summit itself that was called by the uh, general secretariat actually wanted to get out of that framework and to have a more inclusive vision, as I said, in terms of stakeholders, but also a more propositive and constructive agenda that weren't that was not subject to any kind of limitation by any of the stakeholders. In that sense, I think it is also important that the parliaments work on the renovation of this kind of renovation process. Um, as a matter. This way, this is something that we have to revise, and something that we have to allow the parliamentaries uh, proper incidence on the decision making. Something that is rather large than what we currently have. It's not something uh, odd. I think that there's a lot of multilateral exercises that show that this type of methodological elements are possible. So, in this fashion, I wrap up the part that has to deal with the ambition not uh, without uh, uh, highlighting first that there is an element that doesn't rely only on the government and the country development countries and that has to deal with the fulfillment of the, uh, the commitments of the different countries in the different uh, regions we work with the commitment of um, transferring a hundred million dollars yearly uh, uh, elements from 2020 with that trend to the increase that has to be uh, considered and we saw that that didn't happen um we are below that goal and there are serious elements that have to be considered in terms of the goal or the volume of elements that have to be checked that have to be revised for the transfer from now until 2025 on 2030. Uh, this is kind of concerning for me and for parliamentaries in this case, for the different countries that have been developed in our country. And I think it's important for us to take into account that the tra resource transfer is not only a commitment, it's also a commitment uh, of the different countries that are being developed, or so that the countries that are being developed is also the engine that is going to allow uh, a larger element for the countries in development. We have to consider that the national commitments are two types, ones that can be assumed uh, by each state and those that can only be done if there is support uh, um, by others. In many cases, they're talking about advice, technical advice, knowledge, and of course, uh, international cooperation. So having said that, I think that uh, we have the elements for the ambition. On the one hand, we have uh, the incentive that has to be provided to the participation of new players so that some and others can be mutually stimulated is the principle with which the different groups work in the Paris Agreement and is through the invitation or the competence between pairs that can be achieved. We obviously need to have the proper contribution of financial and technological contribution that are more affordable to developing countries. And finally, we need to have a lot more aware that this is part of an integral element. 
uh, final remark rather quick on something that has to deal with the just transition that is one of the elements that was considered in the summit of 2019. On this topic, I had some concerns about using these as a just transition and the lack of a better definition. Uh, we adopted that, but I wanted to highlight that this is not uh, only about of moving towards those trends of social groups or workers that can effectively see their workplaces affected by a transition to clean and renewable energies. I think that this goes way beyond. Do you think that this goes through to an agenda, something where we can see that the employment creation is going to be uh, joined by a transition towards a sustainable model that we have a proper growth, we are, have proper possibilities of growth and that no one has to be left behind. Not only those that are seeing the risk, the positions, but also those that can improve their life conditions with this transition. If they improve their lives, they improve their life, the environment, the different opportunities, and also the economic growth. So having this inclusive vision on what is the just transition, I think that I would wrap up these words, asking you, the parliamentaries again, to continue being involved uh, in all the different topics. Uh, if we talk about transformation of uh, development, I don't see one item of the schedule of parliamentaries that is not relevant for the uh, fight against climate change. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ambassador De Alda, um, for setting now us up for uh, a robust dialogue among the parliamentarians. Uh, colleagues, I have the pleasure to, to tell you, though, that I understand the ambassador will stay with us for the meeting, and he is available then during the dialogue session to, to participate in the dialogue with us. Um, I will now then pass the floor, though, to uh, the Honourable Carolyn Trench Sandiford, the President of the Senate of Belize, has agreed to be our a moderator for today's parliamentary dialogue and panel. Um, Madam President, I pass uh, the floor to you. There you are. Hello. <laughs> Good morning, Alicia. Thank you. Good morning, Excellencies, esteemed guests, panelists and colleagues. It is certainly a pleasure to accompany you all this morning on the plenary session. As I have been the president of the Senate of Belize for only six months, I am acquainted with only a few of you. However, with all the robust work of Parla Americas, I am figuring that that will be corrected um, very soon. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank each and every one of you that is joining us today to discuss the role of parliaments and the measure they take to help address the climate emergency that we are facing. The plenary session is the last of the three activities that were conducted as a part of the fifth gathering of the Parl Americas Parliamentary Network on Climate Change with the theme of addressing inequalities to enable climate ambition, a just transition to achieve the Paris Agreement. On June 4th, an interparliamentary dialogue took place where parliamentarians and parliamentary staff we're able to engage with each other and subject matter experts to discuss strategies to promote a just transition as we pursue efforts towards sustainable development to ensure environmental health, social welfare, and a prosperous, socially responsible economy. Last Tuesday, on June 15th, a dialogue between parliamentarians, youth, and civil society representatives took place which provided the opportunity to converse and learn from each other on good practices to pursue intersectional and inclusive climate action from a legislative point of view, as well as support climate education and create more spaces for participation in decision making. Both meetings resulted in enriching dialogues, so I would like to ask my colleagues who moderated these two sessions to provide a summary of the key takeaways of these events. Our first presentation will come from the Senator, the Honorable Rosa 
Galvez from Canada, who is the Vice President of Parle America's Parliamentary Network on Climate Change for North America, who moderated the Interparliamentary Dialogue. Senator Honorable Rosa Galvez? Yes, good morning, everybody. Thank you, Honorable Caroline Trench Sanford. Um, I had the pleasure of moderating the panel of experts and the subsequent open dialogue during the interparliamentary session we held on June 4, where we welcome more than 100 uh, parliamentarians and parliamentary clerks from across the Americans and the Caribbeans. The panel included a group of experts from the OECD, the Intern American Institute on Justice and Sustainability, the Just Transition Center of the International Tra Trade Union Confederation, and also from the Energy Group of Bogota, with whom we discuss strategies for incorporating gender and intersectional approaches into short and long-term climate plans to promote a just transition and generate decent and clean jobs for all. I would like to share with you some of the highlights of that session, the key takeaways of those sessions. The dialogue was based on a common understanding that those facing social, economic, ethnic and gender inequality are particularly vulnerable to climate change as we've been hearing often, making it, it essential to incorporate intersectional intercultural and gendered approach into the climate policy, as the ambassador just said, to ensure they are inclusive and to prevent their implementation from having any undesirable effect that may exacerbate what is already there, these inequalities. Another central aspect of the discussion focused on the need to transform current production and consumption patterns, habits towards more sustainable and socially just ones than, that will favor low carbon and circular economies. This is also essential as new clean green technologies emerge or become more accessible, such as, for example, solar panels or electrical cars and electrical vehicles. These different technologies, although they will reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, they will still consume certain natural resources. So it is important that, for example, our mining sector have resource efficient and sustainable protocols in place. On this point, the dialogue highlighted the importance of a just transition, a model that seeks to ensure that the benefits of a transition from an economy dependent on unsustainable industries towards a low carbon, knowledge-based, socially inclusive economy are shared widely, while also supporting the countries, the regions, the communities, industries, and particularly the workers, formal and informal, who stand to lose from these transformations. These conversations highlighted key recommendations for legislators for us as we work to support such a transition, such a transformation. And this includes the importance considering the importance of considering regional and local perspectives when developing legislation or overseeing policies in a way that recognizes the socioeconomic and cultural particularities of each context, which in some cases may require decentralized solutions. In the same vein, it was underlined that plans for just transition must not only consider the needs of those who will lose their job, but also the overall impact that the transition will have on communities dependent on unsustainable industries. This will be a considerable challenge for the many communities in our hemisphere that depend on extractive industries, for example. Another point 
we must also um, accomp accompany by an increase in public spending on the development of sustainable sectors and the creation of green jobs. Public-private partnerships can be a useful mechanism for this. In addition, a just transition also requires a strengthening welfare policies to support those who will be affected by this transformation towards sustainable economy. In Canada, we talk about ba um, guaranteed basic income, and, I'm, and I know elsewhere there are also studies on this uh, um, approach. It is also worth noting the importance of incorporating gender perspective in the design of policies and legislations to support a just transition and include measures to enable the participation of women, which is half of the population, in new green jobs by promoting, for example, uh, their education in STEM fields. So like people like me, engineer, a scientist is not a rare bird in our society. So in the fields of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. It would also be essential to raise labor standards in job where women are often overrepresented, such as, for example, the care economy, such as those related to to giving care. As initiative to support green and sustainable development should aim to increase everyone's standards of living, not only those involved in environmentally friendly industries. One of the essential mechanisms to ensure a just and inclusive transition is to establish a dialogue between governments, the private sector workers, and indigenous peoples where applicable that is based on the recognition of workers, humans, and labor rights. As parliamentarians, we can facilitate this dialogue through the legislative process and call on our governments to do so as they de develop climate plans and climate policies. Finally, as we will be discussing today, the dialogue highlighted parliamentarians' crucial role in monitoring the implementation of international climate commitments by, by each of our governments. For example, by advocating for an increased ambition in climate plans or in the national determined contributions that the N NDCs and ensuring that these include provisions to support a just transition are gender responsive and support the needs of vulnerable populations. So these were some of the main conclusions of the dialogue. I would like to thank again the experts and the parliamentarians and civil servants who accompanied us during this interesting session. The fight against the effect of climate change implies an unavoidable transformation, accelerated transformation of our production and consumption patterns towards a circular economy. Um, and a just transition approach that offers a roadmap to bring about this transformation in a way that is democratic, inclusive, and leave no one's behind. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Rosa Galvez. I now invite our second colleague, member of the Legislative Assembly, Paulo Vega from Costa Rica who's the Vice President of the Part America's Parliamentary Network on Climate Change for Central America, who moderated the parliamentary session. Let me see, yes, who moderated the parliamentary dialogue with civil society and youth representatives. Legislative Assembly, Paula Vega. Sí. Buenos días. Eh, un placer estar con... Good morning. It is a pleasure to be with all of you this moment, to be in this important uh, dialogue. I had the pleasure of being able to moderate a marvelous, a lovely dialogue between the civil society, especially youngsters and parliamentaries. The first the conclusion that we had that we have to take from this venue is that it is important to repeat often this type of encounters where the youth that are the ones that have fresh ideas and the ones 
that have all the energy to transform the world, they can effectively bring the information this to the parliamentaries and that the accountability becomes more horizontal. This dialogue was ahead on June 15th. We have over 100 different parliamentaries and youth from the civil society. And I want to highlight some essential items. Something that they were mentioning a lot is about breaking the, the barriers that the youth uh, lose the fear of fighting the representatives, of looking at ourselves as parliamentaries and to work on different confidence that allow us to have a more articulate work. On the different parts, uh, we have something that is vital, that is the action for the climate empowering. It's a concept that on itself is really powerful when we talk about climate change. We have to proceed with an empowering. The groups, the parliamentaries, and all the ones that are in this uh, work have to be empowered. And this concept relates to the Article 6 of the Joint Framework of Climate Change and Article 12 of the Paris Agreement, where, where they talk about different capabilities to the civil society for a better uh, commitment with the work uh, and strengthening the participation, the action and the great work that we have to do is to fill it with content. So how can we reach a good strengthening of the civil society, especially in, as it was mentioned by the people that we had at the beginning, uh, there was a moment where uh, unfathomably we have deniers of climate change growing in great scale in all the different uh, latitudes. So another of the elements that we have in the dialogue that was uh, heavily present in the dialogue is the necessity to have the intersectional elements in the different climate policies. So this not only comes from that on the last uh, dialogue, it was a marvelous dialogue where we came from a woman to a man, from one person to a coastal area, to a person from a rural area and urban area. And it's important to have clear that when you're talking about climate change, uh, we cannot do so from a uh, perspective of privileges that have the ones that have a parliamentary position, but instead of uh, gathering all the different vulnerabilities that are reflecting uh, the impact of the climate change. It's not the same the climate change for a poor woman that for a woman that lives in an urban area. And manage to have our work in these social inequalities that go hand in hand with the just transition. So I want to make a call or to highlight this call that was made to youth to include intersectionality in all our climate actions, to talk about a climate action that is inclusive. And in the same trend, uh, something that caught our attention there was the gender approach. I think that for the next generations, the commitment with the gender approach is something that is uh, rather new and is unadmissible that a policy is not considering breaches between men and women, or even the ones that come from the gender equity and orientation as well. So they talked a lot about the presence and the need to start with the discourse in other areas. So what is it, does it have to deal with the sexual and reproductive health in the concept of meteorological elements, for example? So we have huge challenges that we haven't adopted. And on top of having the task of reflecting the climate change part in the economy, on, this, uh, on the inequality, we have to translate these to the small scales, uh, sexual and reproductive health and the right of health of women, for example. Another important element that we have to consider is the one that is related with the importance of education. There is one that comes with the curriculum, everything with the climate change, the part so that different uh, groups have this deeply rooted in, within themselves, possibly in a good language. And it is a challenge that we have and the people that are working is to have a more accessible uh, language, something common so that the people can identify better the different effects of climate change. So this uh, challenge came with the high needs of working so that our countries and, and, and the other ones that we have from the beginning. We also highlighted the importance of an open government and that is an important line with Parliamericas, everything that we have of open government, accountability, uh, information access. 
and I think that our moment where it, it's it's really shameful that in my country, Costa Rica, that was the cradle of the SKSU agreement, we haven't been able to approve this SKSU agreement because there is fear of a uh, climate um, element of guaranteeing public information and there is fear of the real public participation. So all this topic of creating a good environment and climate change was set on the table. They also mentioned this trust that youth tend to have on the traditional structures of climate change and different countries as we have a challenge uh, to take them back to have them being represented, to make them feel that they have a voice and that comes with other type of periodic and participative works. Uh, many times they asked us to do these venues, to this space, to talk hand in hand with others, with different parliamentaries and to be able to talk about the ideas in that fashion. Of course, we took as the main idea the decoration of um, our youth and children and climate change on the COP25 that can be a guide for these topics. So I take advantage again of this opportunity to ask to the country that haven't adopted these declaration to work so that the government do so, because it's a highly valuable tool that is acknowledging the possibility of agency and leadership that the youth have on the terms of climate change. You talk a lot about uh, communication strategies, political communication strategies that are come close to education, the strategic needs of communication, something more accessible, clearer in both senses. Um, that sounds interesting because we have talked a lot about the need of empowering the civil society to understand the climate phenomenon and to understand it as its own, but also the need of training the different parliamentaries in a way that we can be better spokesperson on the climate change when we have the interest of doing so. Oh, we, they were talking also about these, about communicating better with more regularity, with more clarity, and to work with different awareness, public awareness uh, strategies. These were the main conclusions that we had. And again, uh, what uh, came for us is that we are talking about a valuable space, a space that is uh, adding up and that comes with our parliaments, that we have to emulate this activity of parliamericas and to develop more spaces with youth, with the civil society in a, w in a way that they can be participants of the legislative elements. I want to uh, thank again all the participants that were in these fruitful elements, many of the ones that are here doing so, and we invite you to continue replicating these climate steps that are inclusive. That will be on my behalf. Thank you so much. Thank you. Senator Galvez, again, and thank you, member for the Legislative Assembly, Vega, for providing such informative summaries. We certainly enjoyed listening to those key takeaways. Now, these past events have deepened our understanding, certainly, on strategies to ensure that workers and communities reliant on us, on on unsustainable industries don't get left behind in our pursuit for cleaner and less carbon intensive economies. It is also apparent that as parliamentarians, we need to ensure that youth and CSOs are always consulted and where possibly systematically included in decision-making processes. Now to, in today's sessions, we have the opportunity to continue these discussions and exchange good parliamentary practices to support the development, implementation, or monitoring of national climate commitments to ensure that these commitments are gender responsive and meaningfully involved and respond to the needs of traditionally marginalized and vulnerable communities and promote a just transition. Governments will play a critical role in shaping the outlook for the future and the level of economic and environmental burden that will be put on the youth of today and future generations. The time to act is now. As every year, it becomes increasingly difficult to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement, a sobering cause for concern, given that the impacts of climate change will outweigh those caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. 
The upcoming COP26 is therefore going to be very critical as the level of the ambition of countries updated NDCs will determine whether the world will keep the average global temperature rise under 1.5 degrees centigrade. Unfortunately, based on the recent current climate commitments, we are on track for a 2.40 um, degrees centigrade increase. This is especially concerning for our region and in particular for the small island nations, which will face exacerbated impacts according to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. We need to achieve 1.5 degree census to stay alive, as the Panos Caribbean Initiative has emphasized. So as parliamentarians, we should take a leadership role in making sure our governments are held accountable for their mitigation, adaptation, and disaster risk management commitments, as well as efforts to meet the 2030 agenda and the many other multilateral environmental agreements our, country, our countries have adopted. We should also ensure that our government support a green recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic to build back better, a great opportunity, considering the vulnerability of our region to the impacts of climate change and the potential co-benefits associated with achieving a clean and sustainable environment for population health, economic opportunities, and for reducing inequalities. Our panel discussion will consist of three presentations that will aim to showcase the role of parliament and good practices that are, that are being implemented across the hemisphere to support the achievement of the Paris Agreement. The presentations will be followed by an open dialogue where I am encouraging all of you to participate and to share the good practices or related experiences to climate action in your communities and perhaps even what you do as a part of your work or your passion. It is now therefore my pleasure to introduce our three panelists. And I am going to start with our first, who will set the stage for our panel discussion by providing an overview, by providing an overview of Parliament's role in supporting the implementation of the Paris Agreement and to identify key priorities for parliamentary action. I now invite Rafael Jimenez Aybar, Environmental Democracy Advisor of the Westminster Foundation for Democracy. Rafael? Uh, thank you, Honorable Carolyn Trent Sandiford. Um, I would like to start by thanking Parliamericas for having invited me to participate in this fifth gathering of the Parliamentary Network of Climate Change focused on a just transition to achieve the Paris Agreement. Me gustaría también pedirles disculpas a los... I would, also like to, I would also like to apologize because I'm going to speak in... As Senator Carolyn, so I am going to... I'm going to speak in English. I'm sorry about that. ...that you can now see posted in the chat box as a link. Uh, parliaments and the Paris Agreement, strengthening parliamentary engagement in the development and implementation of international climate commitments in the Americas and the Caribbean, which was prepared by Parliamericas with the support of WFD. By now, it is commonplace to say that parliaments have a critical role to play in advancing climate governance, but it is so important that any occasion is good to stress it. And so the report does look with detail into the role of parliaments in that regard with a particular focus on gender responsiveness, public participation, and just transition in climate legislation and policies. But still, that's the theory. So what we wanted now also was to take stock on what has happened on this front when we are uh, entering the fifth year since the Paris Agreement entered into force. So as part of the development of this report, a survey was circulated to the parliaments of the Americas and the Caribbean to understand how parliaments have organized their work to advance climate actions and collect good practices. The findings demonstrated that while significant institutional and legislative advances are taking place, there is room for greater coordination of parliamentary efforts to align their climate work with the implementation of climate commitments and the Paris Agreement. 
and I will mention a few. Uh, many parliaments have established mechanisms for receiving information from the governments on the results of conferences of parties, of COPs, uh, to the Paris Agreement and the government's national climate commitments. But more can be done to align the corresponding committee's legislative oversight and budgetary responsibilities with the international objectives. For example, only a small number of parliaments have carried out or reviewed assessments of the readiness and adequacy of national legislation and policy for the implementation of the NDCs and long-term climate strategies to identify legislative priorities or examine these objectives to ensure that plans are ambitious enough and consider the potential and intended impacts on vulnerable populations, including gender impacts as per the UNFCCC Gender Action Plan. Or they have examined their government's other international commitments related to the Paris Agreement and their corresponding legislative needs, like the implementation of action for climate empowerment initiatives to warranty access to information, education, and public participation in relation to climate issues. So please let me guide you quickly through 10 major entry points, among many others, uh, identified in the report, which I definitely encourage you to have a look at, uh, for parliaments to steer climate action. There are also several sets of questions that have been included in the report to guide parliamentarians willing to exploit these 10 entry points and more. Number one, uh, participating in conferences of parties, because parliaments can have a role in informing negotiation positions in advance and also in approving the ratification of those agreements. Parliamentarians can also participate as members of their country's official delegation to COPs. And good practices of parliamentary participation in national delegations and on shaping international positions have been reported in Mexico, for instance. And I'm afraid that I cannot go into detail describing each of the examples that I will mention, but you will find descriptions for each of the examples that I'm going to mention in the guide. Second entry point, participating in the formulation of nationally determined contributions, the NDCs. This is really important because taking into consideration the updated NDCs and the commitments made at the leader summit, which took place in April 2021, uh, we are still set for a 2.4 warming by the end of the century, uh, which is in a catastrophic range and certainly exceeds the Paris Agreement goals on limiting global warming to well below two degrees Celsius. So participation of parliaments in the design of NDCs is important to ensure that they are appropriate in terms of ambition and that consider human rights obligations, especially the potential impact of indigenous peoples, Afro-descendants, migrants, children, people with disabilities and people in vulnerable situations more broadly that they include a gender-based analysis and apply an intersectionality lens as per the gender action plans of the Paris Agreement, and also that they include a plan on action for climate empowerment, and also that they include these actions as a strategic delivery mechanism, but I will go into that a bit later. Good practices of parliamentary participation in one way or another in the design of the NDCs have been reported in Nicaragua, in Guatemala, in Mexico, Panama, Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, again, I cannot enter into detail, but uh, you will find the descriptions. Now let's move to the entry points related to the function of oversight. There are a few more entry points. Number three, uh, parliaments can establish a process for regular monitoring of progress on national climate commitments. In this sense, we have good practices, uh, for example, in Guatemala, Peru, and in Mexico again. Number four, parliaments can review and monitor the development and implementation of national climate commitments to ensure that there is a participatory process in the development of these commitments. They may also ensure that they are ambitious and proportionate to the country's contribution to global emissions, as well as promote the inclusion of a just transition plan and a gender-based analysis. Parliamentarians can review the government's target to ensure that they are aligned with the Paris Agreement. Good practices here, well, we can see something in Canada where both chambers have been active along these lines, and also in Trinidad and Tobago with a great emphasis in the uh, in gender issues. Number five, uh, parliaments can undertake post-legislative scrutiny of existing climate legislation, which is a review of existing legislation that aims to support the, the efforts to ensure that it is imp effectively implemented and it, that it is having the intended outcomes. Because many fields of knowledge related to climate change, for instance, technological solutions, such as renewable energy, are always evolving and new knowledge is always emerging. So it is helpful to evaluate and update regularly this legislation based on the latest advancements. Um, here are some product placement. Uh, WFB has developed a guide outlining an approach to assessing the implementation and the impact of climate and environmental legislation at national level. So I'm going to send the link to the publication in the chat box. I'm afraid it's only in English. Uh, next uh, entry point would be uh, number six promoting participation in international accountability mechanisms. Because 
starting in 2023, and then every five years, governments are going to take stock on the implementation of the Paris Agreement to assess progress. Well, it was high time. Uh, but parliamentarians can make sure that their governments engage in these international accountability mechanisms, which are key to ensure as a global community that we are on track. Then comes the well understood uh, area of uh, intervention for and legislating for the implementation of the Paris Agreement. Um, the 2021 NDC synthesis report carried out by the UNFCCC Secretariat uh, has revealed that many parties have integrated their NDC targets and goals and policies into national legislation and planning to ensure implementation. And this is good to know, but is it done in a comprehensive way? So this is why it is important that Parliament's number seven, as an entry point, adopt a legal requirement to hold the governments accountable on national climate commitments. We have observed good practices in this sense in Canada, in Suriname, and in Chile, for example. Number eight, assessing uh, legislative gaps to deliver national commitments because efforts can be made to mainstream climate considerations into all bills. In this sense, uh, good practices have been noted in Mexico, or again, both chambers, in Nicaragua, in Ecuador, and in Paraguay. Entry point number nine. I'm going to go into a bit of detail here, and you will forgive me, but this is, this is my, my specialty, and also this is where I'm working most at the moment in uh, WFT, which is supporting the implementation of action for climate empowerment and inclusive climate action more broadly. You may be familiar with this term, with ACE, Action for Climate Empowerment, but under the UNFCCC, it refers to efforts that are outside of the Paris Agreement or of the Kyoto Protocol before, efforts that refer to empower all members of society in understanding and engaging in inclusive climate action through education, training, public awareness, public participation, and public access to information. As I said, this is, happens outside of the Paris Agreement, although there are a the number of, of uh, explicit linkages, although I believe that the implicit linkages are much more important. Uh, to begin with, this uh, work strand acknowledges the critical role of non-government actors and aims to empower them to engage in climate governance, which in turn will end up strengthening government efforts by creating an, an ambition loop. So parliaments can support uh, these efforts in various ways, including adopting or strengthening the national access to information law, as Senator uh, Paola was referring to a moment ago. Like we have a problem in, in Costa Rica, apparently, with the ratification of Escazú, but this is really important. Adopting or strengthening legislation related to environmental education, skill development and training. Yes. Then parliaments can also adopt legislation that requires public consultation in the development of climate plans. I think this is really critical. Then calling on governments uh, to adopt multi-annual ACE strategies and work plans and ensure that they are aligned with their own climate planning, including the formulation of NDCs. Also, to ensure that uh, these plans are reflected in national action plans because, uh, related to similar pledges and commitments that may be made under, for example, SCAZU agreement, but also under platforms like the Open Government Partnership, of which many of your countries are members. Then it's important that these uh, plans on action for climate empowerment are communicated to the UNFCCC as part of the updated NDCs. And of course, that uh, they are adequately resourced and implemented through the exercise of uh, budgetary and oversight powers. But parliaments can also serve as delivery partners of the national ACE plans. For example, communicating information on legislative work related to climate issues with the constituents on an ongoing basis and creating the spaces for public participation in the development of climate legislation. And the most urgent one would be on calling on your governments to push for a high ambition agreement on a new multi-annual ACE framework, which is going to be adopted in Glasgow. Until now, we have been operating under the first of these uh, multi-annual plans, which was adopted in Doha in 2012, but it expired. It expired in the year 2012, uh, 2020. Sorry. So this should have been adopted at the last COP, uh, which hasn't still taken place, in fact. So it will be adopted now in, in Glasgow. And this is important uh, for two reasons. And the first one is that the, the transition to a more environmentally sustainable society needs to be rooted in climate justice and needs to seek equitable equitably to improve the community resilience, to ensure a just transition, and to leave no one behind. Because climate legislation can impact negatively marginalized uh, populations and indigenous peoples, and also workers and communities that are reliant on non-sustainable industries that are engaged to develop just transition strategies. And the second reason why this is so important is that, in my, to my view, this is the lifeblood of the Paris Agreement. Because if uh, there is no societal buy-in, 
uh, for climate policies. There will be a moment when parliamentarian politicians will, will hit the wall. There will not there will not be any more political space to uh, to legislate for or implement greater ambition. So if there isn't a concerted effort in building this political space for ever increasing ambition, which is the key of the arch of the Paris Agreement, the, the ratchet mechanism for ever increasing ambition, if the political space for this ambition is not built, the Paris Agreement will be, in fact, will be dead. It will not be implementable. And going back to this, uh, there have been a number of uh, good practices identified on, on ACE-related action in Panama, in Argentina, in Colombia, in El Salvador, the Dominican Republic, Grenada, St. Lucia, and also in the UK, I have to say. And then the final entry point would be budgeting, the budgeting for the Paris Agreement. So parliaments need to scrutinize budget proposals to ensure that they align with national climate commitments in cooperation with uh, parliamentary budget offices, where you have them. Good practice is observed in Barbados, in Canada, in Chile, in Mexico, and in Peru, to name a few. Then it's important to promote the alignment of fiscal incentives with national climate commitments. There are good practices in Canada and in the US as well. Then parliaments can champion the incorporation of climate considerations in post-COVID-19 economic stimulus packages. Given the urgency of the climate emergency and the co-benefits of a green recovery for population health, economic opportunities, and for reducing inequality, uh, I would encourage you to consult Parallel America's guide on supporting a post-COVID-19 green economy recovery. If you allow me a second, I will post it. The link also in the chat box. Let's see. Here it is. I'm not sure if there is a version in English, in Spanish. I mean, probably there is. So um, then, finally, uh, well, just to mention that a particularly good practice has been identified in Chile with a, an emphasis in the hydrogen economy, green hydrogen. And then uh, you can call on governments to meet international financing commitments. So in countries that are recipient of official development assistance in of ODA, it is important, I believe, that these funds are also included as revenue in the national budget proposal alongside international loans, because this allows parliamentarians to, to assess the total budget being allocated towards national development priorities and climate. In this sense, good practices have been observed in Chile, in Colombia, in Ecuador, El Salvador, and in Honduras. Now, uh, budgets and budgeting processes are not gender neutral, and without an appropriate analysis, they can be gender blind and intentionally, and intentionally reinforcing inequities between and among groups of women and men. But one of the benefits of analyzing the budget from a gender perspective is that it can help reveal how government revenue and expenditure are supporting the achievement of international commitments made in priority areas such as women's rights and sustainable development, and what adjustments may be necessary to reach these goals and, and obligations. For, for more inter information, I would recommend also to consult another Parliament America's document. I will again post a link on intersectionality. So this is a practical tool for intersectionality policy analysis. Again, I suspect this must be available in two languages. But I only have the English one. Um, so just uh, I would like to give you some some parting words. So. Pardon. What, what could I give as a final message, considering that the focus of this meeting is the, is the just transition to achieve the Paris Agreement? So I will go back to my message of uh, taking an interest on, on what your government is planning to do uh, at COP26 with regard to the adoption of a new ACE action plan, multi-annual action plan, and try to get involved in the new plans for implementation. Also, you could check if your country is a part, partner of uh, open government uh, platform uh, partnership. You could ensure that your country includes some climate objectives in the new work plan. And why is this so important? Uh, I think it's fair to say that the, the examples of action for climate empowerment that I mentioned in a number of countries across the hemisphere, they did not necessarily reflect an awareness of the international framing of AIDS among parliamentarians. So the full potential of this mechanism, which is the lifeblood of the Paris Agreement, creating ever increasing political space for society own policies is not being exploited. So I would encourage you to take an interest in this. And by the way, if you are interested, let me inform you that WFD uh, is going to, to publish a joint submission together with World Resources Institute as to what the, the key features of the new regime should look like. So uh, I would be very happy to share it with all of you through Parla Americas. And, uh, Say, if you want any more information about what you can do in this to engage on climate for action for climate empowerment as parliamentarians, please come back to me. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Raphael. And of course, I encourage all our participants to have their notes taken right now. Any comments or questions that they would wish to pose because at the end of the third final um, presentation of the um, third panelists, we will certainly be opening up the floor for conversation. So along the way, take notes, comments, questions, and then have them ready for the open dialogue. So at this time, I want to introduce, invite and introduce our second panelist, Senator Katia Abro from Brazil, who is the president of the Committee on Foreign Relations and National Defense to share her experience from the Senate of Brazil. Senator Katia? Olá, boa tarde, bom dia a todos. Eu gostaria de repetir que sou senadora. Good evening to you all. I'd like to start. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, can you hear me? All right, that sounds good. Once again, my name is Katia Breus. I'm a senator from Brazil. By the second mandate, I was also in the federal side of Brazil. I've been working on the public sector for more than 20 years. I have worked with the agricultural sector all my life. I've been working with this sector since I was 25, when I became a widow and when I had my children at a very low age. So I started to work with this sector. I started to work with different sectors at the agricultural sector, the union and the patronal sector from my city and then to my state. And now I'm a representative of one of the biggest entities in Brazil, which is the Confederation of the Culture Sector. And then I became Minister of Agriculture uh, when Dilma Rousseff was in office. You could now be the president of these uh, foreign policies from my country. At the Federal Senate, we have an environmental commission and here it is important to think why the foreign policy is a close to the environmental issues. And it is very easy. Well, first of all, this is a very important issue. But besides that, the foreign policy is also a commission on how we can represent the armed forces in our country. When I first began, I used to be the first woman to be in this kind of scenarios. And I had to face many different challenges, not only the ones that had to do with the business and the different products that we had in our country, but on everything that had to do with the environmental issues. So that's why I'm going to present you why I think it is very important my participation today. I would like to greet the Senator of uh, Paraguay, Blanca Ovelar, President of Parla Americas, and Eduardo Ramirez, president of the Mexican uh, Senate. And I would also like to greet the rest of, the, of my colleagues and the rest of the parliamentarians who are here today. Thank you very much for opening up this kind of uh, spaces in order to discuss these different issues that have to do with the most important issues in our governments, especially on what has to do with climate change today. This is something that started back in 1992. So we've been working with this for over almost 30 years that we've been working on this. We've been discussing this environmental issue. And when I went back to this and I wanted to talk about my, my career. So for more than 15 years, I wanted to avoid these issues, especially on what had to do with the agricultural sector. At the beginning, we were very resistant to these new rules. And somehow we felt activated and pressured and also, let's say, morally violated because of these new rules that we had at the moment. So that was the beginning of a story. And 
from the last 15 years, all of this mindset has changed. And of course, I came to the conclusion that there isn't agriculture without water, without good environmental conditions, without a regular rain, and without a series of environmental aspects that we need to have in mind for the production. So I learned that this rainforest that we have, even though it is very rich in biodiverse terms in flora and fauna, we I also learned that that the agricultural and the agricultural research center is a key institution that taught me that the Amazon rainforest is key to guarantee the rainforest uh, towards the center and south of the country with our rivers and everything that we have in our country. Something that I was not aware of and that impacted me. But for the last 15 years, I have evolved and I have studied what the impact of these issues is in, an, in my day-to-day -day life. And also on what the importance of the preservation is, not only because of the sake of the biodiverse richness, but also the productivity, because without climate, without the, without the environment, they're going to become poor or we're going to come down to poverty. So in the last 40 years, we moved from having a big importer com a country from very expensive um, goods that actually, and now 40 years after we are a gigantic producer on food production and we export and we are exporters. So we are not only feeding our uh, our people from Brazil, but we are also providing food for some other countries, especially Asia, Europe, and some, and some other European countries that are pretty much the receivers of our goods. So the, agro, the agricultural sector is one of the most important sectors in our country. It represents one third of the production of our country and also the employability of our country. So I wanna show you how this issue, how this environmental and climatic aspect has to be there at the center of the discussion, because this is affecting us in economical terms. Of course, this population, of course, we do respect this, um, this population, but most of the times they do not understand what the impact of these uh, changes or what these regulations may mean. So in order to get started, we have five different biomes. We have 8,500,000 square kilometers of all of these territories. We have more than 66 um, areas where 30% of these areas are for the production of food. And then we have the rainforest and we have 3.5% of our country is distinct to countries or to rural, I'm sorry, the city life. Uh, regarding the Amazon rainforest, we have 410 million hectares. So it is pretty much half of our country. If we put all of this together, this all of these different biomes that are coming from different countries that are our neighbors, we could say more than 40 million of hectares where we have this Amazon rainforest. And just as a interesting information, Brazil preserves 66% per, of its original biomes. But if we take out this Amazon rainforest, we are going to preserve 82% of our rainforest and our jungle. So this is going to contribute for a national average of 66% of, of total preservation. Our energy is one of the cleanest in the world. And it goes around 26% of its natural matrix and the United States is 15%, China 20% and Brazil has 83% of, of this matrix which is completely clean with a hydraulic energy, wind energy, solar energy, and biomass energy. So only 26% of the, 
I mean, less of 20% has to do with non-clean energy or there's, let's say, dirty energy. I worked with the agricultural ministry, with the Ministry of Agriculture. We have worked together with the ministry and the Ministry of Mines and Energy, and we have worked to actually achieve the different objectives of the Paris Agreement because we knew and we were completely sure that we were completely able to actually com achieve the different goals that have been signed in the Paris Agreement. So we were convinced about the ideas that our government had. And I wanted to prove that this legislation in Brazil, which is one of the most strict ones, because we know that there isn't any other country where they have a legislative system as strict as the one that we have. And these legislations, we know that they are not enough. Even though it is, they are very strict, they're not enough. For example, on everything that has to do with deforestation, because for the last two years, we saw how deforestation uh, actually had increased. And we saw how all of this had affected our country. And we had to go through many different difficult situations. But I would like to recall that, and I would like to tell all of my colleagues that Brazil was not always like this. It was not always like this. And it will not be like that uh, because we're living in a democracy where some of the legislations and some things change every four years. We have three points that are important because we want to work or we are working on them on the implementation we are preparing on the Congress of Brazil on the official stance of the Brazilian uh, Congress on this position, along with the Commission of the Environment. We're working on the position that we want to have for COP15 in China and for uh, 2026 in Glasgow. So we are going to have for the first time, ladies and gentlemen, an official document from the government of Brazil, the second one. And this uh, same token, I'm going to show the a draft that is going to be uh, worked. I hope that I can apply these before as, as COPs, that is for the uh, compliance of our goal, our set. President Bolsonaro uh, has a commitment in the Congress over the April 22nd that has been uh, worked by Pre President Biden where we are going to be reducing deforestation until 2030. As many countries have the same commitment with the draft that reduces uh, for 2025 those goals. And I want to say why. Not only just to certify what other countries are doing, and uh, the reality we are talking about the reduction of emissions, as well as the contribution to the weather. Brazil, ladies and gentlemen, has more possibilities because we have have an energy matrix, a clean energy matrix, while other countries will have to work hard to be able to reduce their goals because they will need to reduce the energy matrix and they are going to spend some million dollars to do so while the problem in brazil is deforestation uh, our energy matrix is green we don't have to spend much money to do that and to reduce deforestation is what we have to do as well as we have reduced and we did on 2015 2016 we need to have a political will to do so we have to strengthen the uh, council bodies that have been completely deactivated. The resources for the budget have been uh, cut as well. So also we have to create an official party for the COP where we can uh, work with the GDPs, with uh, uh, the, the development plans that have been checked for 2015, uh, reaffirming these uh, goals to have a compliance program. And also we want to discuss uh, the article on the article of the Paris Agreement that has to deal with environmental services. Brazil is doing its work, but we had a low carbon agriculture with a really modern techniques with less emission and uh, uh, it cannot mean that that is going to be the true picture. That is not our Brazil. 
these last two years are not what Brazil thinks. That first of all, our position on the drafts on different uh, projects that we do on reducing this term from 2030 to 2025 and guarantee, of course, that in Brazil, the budget that had been cut for this year, it was slashed in half for the control bodies. We have fought and we have talked with the government under my command and we have recovered and we double the budget, environmental uh, budget we have, that if even uh, it's part of the program. And on the uh, Institute, we were able to reach to this budget that we have, but we want to have more next year. We want to have resources to achieve these goals, like to have funding for the producers to recover 12 million of hectares of forests that have been planted, where a large deal we are uh, advancing with this uh, project. We want to have a co-funding and we have worked with Copenhagen. We have had resources for a low carbon agriculture and uh, work with the producers with the bioeconomy. And we have two marvelous things as well. We have a civil society that is really active and is attentive to everything that is happening on environmental terms, on the bodies that are working. And we have a class, an entrepreneurial class that is reformulating all these elements uh, for the moment that we have in time and seeing the geopolicy around the world that is focused on the environmental part. I want to call the attention to the water issue. When we talk about biodiversity in China, we want to create a document about the Brazilian stance on the maintenance of the forest around the world and also the preservation of water, of the shores of the rivers, of the basic sanitation, because this is a finite uh, resource, it's not renewed, and water it would be renewed if we start taking care of our uh, rivers, of our water sources, and if we do a basic cleansing on our countries. And I want to wrap up thanking one more time the opportunity of being here with you. It is a pleasure. And thank you very much for the global development plans with our work with the planet. That is not a favor that we have to do for others. It's a favor for us and for the other generations. Now I'm a grandma and I have four grandchildren. I worry about them. And I want them to remember about an active grandmother, a productive grandmother that is working on sustainable terms, that is working on environmental sustainability and economic work. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Katia, grandmother. <laughs> Thank you so very much. I now invite our third panelist, member of the Chamber of Deputies, Ivan Flores, and former president of the Chamber of Deputies to share his experiences from the Chamber of Deputies of Chile. Hola, buenos días. Hi, good morning and good afternoon for some of you. Uh, rather briefly, I want to summarize what we, our country, has been doing as a response to what progressively we have been seeing. It's good to remember uh, the placement where we are in the concept. And we have to acknowledge that even though Chile is a uh, long uh, strip of land, and as it has been described by poets and writers, we have a highly productive uh, position, but also really susceptible to the effects of the climate change. Chile is one of the most acceptable countries to this uh, event. Due to an ocean that is rather cold for the Antarctic Humboldt uh, area that it comes from the Antarctica and that is uh, washing more than 700,000 kilometers of the insular area. And it's creating a climate condition that is rather um, specific. Something is sensitive to the climate change. Within this context, that is an environmental context and a productive, productive one that is creating uh, social conditions uh, for these uh, conditions where the large desert and the northern part has blessed us with minerals like lithium for electromobility or for the growing and very highly advanced 
uh, solar energy that is being created inside the great desert of Atacama, the most arid one in the world, uh, where we have attempted uh, or have, we have misattempted, we have tried to force the relationship between the energy needs and the interest of the citizenry, especially on the southern part of Chile, that is the part where I have to live, where the forest, the te tepid one creates a specific condition that is rather unique for the growth of different species, uh, arboreas and, and others, and also the agricultural uh, creation. And when we have rivers that are uh, going in these low range and the low area from the Andean region to the sea in a couple of hours, we can create hydraulic energy. And the tension that is created between the community and the national interests on creating energy, they have created another additional problem that is a large participation of the energy that is generated by thermal electrical plants coal plants that are around 40% of the matrix and that Chile has a, a committed to eliminate from now to 2050. I have to say as a parliamentary that in the last days, particularly the last week, the National Congress has been forcing the government. I am from opposition, but I have to talk as a country. They have been forced to uh, delay the terms and in this fashion, on the so-called on the sacrifice areas that are some localities that are more exposed to the industrial activity or to the thermal electric creation of coal plants we have been able to have a draft that forces the government to advocate uh, for in the south uh, to to make haste to start reducing these thermal electrical plants and to accelerate something that is are friendlier with environment. I want to make a short context of our reality, and that probably is going to be similar to the one that we have in other countries, because we know that the effects of the climate change created mostly by the heavily industrialized countries, they are impacting in a rather brutal manner the poor countries or the poor of the unequal countries as well. And in this fashion, the necessity of, uh, of, of moving or having resiliency in these countries or the poor countries in unequal places is a lot slower than the rich countries. So that's what we're doing. Uh, we, uh, the rich countries have the productivity and we keep the tab with us. So these international element should not be left aside, that we should have the priorities in terms of unity that we have to have in our countries. I'm talking about Parla Americas, where the Latin American countries and Caribbean have to be very clear that the international agreements always have to uh, vouch for the strength of the unity. I'm saying these for the great example of the Alliance of Pacific, of the not so good that has happened in other part type of encounters the mexico alliance and chile that are a good example of what we should be doing so that the unity uh, works for us i want to say two things in our country because that's what i they ask us to do as uh, the whole planet we have also been submitted to different uh, new tensions economic tensions social tensions political, all of them together, and some of them are causing the others, and also exchanging these elements. And uh, we had a gift that is the pandemic that nowadays is giving an additional uh, element to these factors that we have in the last years of 2019, being a president of the chamber. Chile had a social outburst, a social mobilization, that was not a resonance of what was happening in France or Spain with their social massive mobilization. We alone, we were the ones that were causing or were guilty of what the citizenry, citizens happened to what happened to them, that they were tired of listening, even though our country was growing at a good speed and we had a rather substantial growth in their 
life conditions. And for that reason, we came to the OECD. So what happened? What was the difficulty? Even though we were in the OECD with all the merits to do so, and we had a social uh, outburst that was uh, showing the problems that we had with the retirement funds, with others, some growing elements that are of in terms of safety, security. I mean, we have a consensus um, the element that wasn't considered by the government was considered by the national government, the two chambers and the deputy and the new constitution of the Republic. And we started it in a process that uh, was taken uh, 144 constituents with a special uh, spaces for the originary, original uh, people that we thought that there were the nine. And in the end, last year, we found out that there is a uh, 10th that was uh, considered lost, the Teltinum. In the Ch Chilean Patagonia, that they were murdered at the beginning of 1990 as a product of immigration. So at the end of 2019, Chile had to move and had to leave the APEC and the COP25. And for the reasons of these, these uh, outbursts couldn't be done. However, there was a prior redressing effectively to have a proposal from Chile to the members and the participants of the uh, uh, COP. We had hard evidence. We had to gather institutional information, territorial information, original groups, information from the citizens as well. So uh, we had this response where we had this uh, mobilization. And afterwards, after a year of looking for a proper alignment on the national government and the government to give a proper answer to this mobilization, the social mobilization, we have the pandemic. And the pandemic makes that we have, uh, we submerge the priorities that we had defined before, both in terms of the climate change and our response and the ones and the response of the social uh, requests. Both things are still pending and they are not moving. I just have the priority that is another one. So within this context, we prepared a draft, we created a project that I'm not going to count it completely. I'm just going to summarize some of these elements that I've considered are, they are important to see. Uh, we have to acknowledge that we didn't have a framework that could allow to assign responsibilities of the, of the networks, how each one of the different uh, players and social players have to be assumed to reduce the emission and to request the implementation and the report of the mitigation elements of adaptation to the impact of climate change. We have to fulfill what we have uh, uh, signed. We have 57 uh, free trade agreements and most of them have been inscribed, or most of the environment, except CBS Kazoo, that is something that we have in tension between the government and the opposition. We want the agreement of Eskisu to be signed and we have said that uh, often. So now the draft project that has been in the Senate for some months should be going to the Chamber of Deputies in a second procedure. And it has been improved given the large participation of the citizenry, something that is coming not only from the government, but it also is coming from the National Congress and their reclaim of their organizations, even in the pandemics. In this context, I can attest that, uh, for example, even though uh, the project has a thousand different parliamentary indications that have come from the citizen work and they are uh, trying to establish and to systematize this. And specifically, uh, we had the need to have different organizations, NGOs and other experts to systematize what the citizens were uh, claiming, proposing, and uh, they are doing a proper draft of the account to be able to link what the citizens are thinking in terms of what we are legislating. I uh, think uh, both of them we find really virtuous. Uh, so in this context, Chile wants to do carbon neutral for 2050, something that I was telling you this week that we approved this project where 
we are telling to the government that we are not available so that plants under 30 years of old that are creating energy with coal keep working until 2025. You see how tight our term. But we believe so, and we believe that the government will start moving the axis from their requests to be able to continue improving the acceleration, the solar acceleration, or the creation of other sources that are different to these thermal plants. The vote was uh, very striking in our National Congress. So the draft uh, uh, considers in a rather meaningful manner the regional variable and the local variable on the creation of different institutions, both from the region. Uh, Chile has 16 regions as the political administrative division and the institutional organization, regional organizations that are going to have an important part of the governance according to this draft of climate change. They must gather information. They have to transform them into public policies regulate uh, the budget that is implemented in each one of the institutions. And this is connected with each one of the 358 municipalities or different places uh, to use a general term in our country. Therefore, we are going to create these national climate uh, elements for as an, an important part of the growth of the action in the national region in direct connection with the institutions and the common institutions and also with the linking of the citizenry. I'm not going to say uh, much else. So uh, on the part of the project that we are vouched to, to take beh uh, behind, that the mitigation for the concentration of the greenhouse gas are being uh, tightened considering what was the original proposal. We are generating a series of institutionalities to effectively being able to measure and to propose some changes on what it, it, it is our contribution to climate change. When I talk about climate change, I'm talking about the good and the bad as well. And we are working on the decision a tool not only for this part of this political tradition that usually doesn't transcend beyond the terms of our government, but we are creating tools on the medium and long term. For this reason, the law uh, is really ambitious in terms of generating these tools. And I have to make a parenthesis on what I said at the beginning. We are about to start the next week on July the 5th, we are going to start the process, the constituent process in Chile with autonomy, with uh, a proper contribution, both from the government and the different financial support, etc. So the Congress is going to be left for the constitutional work, where without a doubt, the environmental part is going to be essential for the same process. This has to be finished according to the uh, law that is regulating on, on June na next year. Also, the law considers a vulnerability element when we have some financing tools. And this gives uh, of, of ground because it gives, you, gives us commitments and some other elements from the regions, the regional governments with more and more autonomy and just one week ago, we chose for the first time in our history as a republic, the 16 governors, the regional governors. They were elected and not designed by the uh, government that was in turn. And what we hope to have with a new institution, it is going to regulate how the national governments are working for the funding of the clean production and to reduce the impact. So what are the problems that we have in our project? And I'm reminding you this so that you know what is what are the challenges that we have to find. The first thing is that we cannot be having carbon budget shared between different interested parties. We need to see a uh, focus from the human rights and it has to be a participative process. 
we have to ensure that the resources and the capability um, had the proper application of this. And this has to be procured always. The laws have not to be made to just to be set on writing without a working, but we have to cover everything so that indeed they are respected and covered by all. But we have a process where the National Congress has worked and has created something that was rather sluggish at the beginning. We have uh, more than four, 5,000 different consultations, different participations, because there are queries at the same time, our suggestions on how can we structure this new process. Many of those proposals that we have in the National Congress can be transformed into indications that we have in debate. And this is a permanent process too. We have to see how the measurement and the, uh, is properly done. And we are convinced that we have to work on the SKSU part. Chile was one of the SKSU uh, promoters and then a government backs down for some of the different than the environmental part. Um, accountability to achieve the climate changes and actions committed is a core part for the commitment of the law. Is our work that we have done to have uh, to meet our commitments and to have a proper accountability that are the ones that are working on this. We have a lot of details that we can do so that, uh, you know, what is the this process and the climate change on carbon where we are going to be committed with. You can have all the information uh, on our work and basically entering into the library of the Congress. That is one of the best things that we have in our country because it only has text, but more than a hundred different specialists that can effectively help you, my colleagues, that I, again, want to um, say hi, I want to regard with my utmost esteem, well, my colleagues from Palamericas, but we have information readily available for you. So I'm wrapping up these, uh, thanking for this invitation, telling you that in Chile, we are taking our responsibility. We know that what we do now is what our next generations are going to have in the future. Social inequalities that we have, we are trying to, to answer to them because we were able to understand the message that we have in the community. And that's why I say that the effects of climate change, social mobilization and pandemics, even though they have uh, made our things so difficult and our health and our economic as well, is giving us now opportunities of being more comprehensive about the things that we have and what, what we have to do in the future. Thank you so much. And I hope that you have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, member of the Chamber of Deputies, Ivan Flores from Chile. And once again, to all to our other two panelists for sharing with us these initiatives, which are truly very interesting and certainly very insightful. As important, I think the presentations were also very inspiring and widened the menu of possibilities of ideas for climate action by parliamentarians. So at this time, I would like to open the floor to all the participants so that you can share your own parliamentary experiences um, and your initiatives for inclusive climate action and to promote greater climate ambition, as well as for you to ask any question you may have from the panelists. As a reminder, we are behind time. So I'm going to ask you to be very brief in your question or your intervention. Um, for if you wish to speak or make a comment or, or make an intervention, please use the raise your hand function and I will be provided with your, your name and then we will call upon you. 
We will start the open dialogue though with Senator Ricardo Velasquez Mesa, who is the Secretary of the Committee of Environment, Natural Resources and Climate Change from the Senate of Mexico. Senator Ricardo Velasquez, you have the floor. Madam President, it seems that he might have uh, been knocked out of the meeting. Can we please move to Mr. Okay, Debbie, absolutely. who is the first? Thank you. Absolutely. Okay, I see Debbie from Suriname having their hands up. Hand up, Debbie, please go ahead. Yes, thank you. It's a pleasure to be in the meeting the first time. I've listened to Mr. Rafael Jimenez and the others. I have a question for Mr. Uh, Rafael. He mentioned that he has done an assessment in the region about the legislation regarding the climate change. I would like to know what uh, is here, is, what is your opinion about the existing legislation and if uh, there can be a model legislation for the region so that all the countries that uh, are facing some problems uh, to implement uh, climate change activities they can ad adapt the uh, legislation to that model. Thank you. Rafael? You're on mute, Rafael. I think you're on mute. Yes. <laughs> thank you. So, if and thank you for the question. So, if I understand correctly, uh, you were asking uh, about, uh, say, um, overall best practice uh, example of climate legislation that uh, could be examined carefully and see whether it can be replicated across the region. Yes, that's it. <laughs> and that is a very, very tall order. And in fact, uh, just not to take undue credit, um, the, the review that I have been skimming through was carried out by the, by the Parliamericas team. So perhaps it would have a fresher understanding but I think that uh, among in the in the Americas region, uh, Mexico was the first country to adopt a comprehensive uh, climate law, uh, which is to some extent modeled in the, the UK uh, Framework Climate Act, which was the first in the world, uh, which uh, had two fundamental features which had, that had made it uh, very popular and also quite effective and certainly easy enough to replicate as a model. The first one is the, the concept of carbon budgets. So uh, central to this approach is the, the notion that uh, uh, every, uh, every few years, every five years, I believe, is the case of the UK, I'm not sure about Mexico, but uh, there is a decision made on how much CO2 can be emitted. And then uh, the necessary legislation is adopted to make sure that this happens. But how? Uh, well, or following whose criterion? The law establishes an independent body of experts called the Climate Change Committee, which provides independent advice uh, to, the, to, the, to the government as to how these emission targets, these emission ambitions could be delivered uh, from I mean, carrying out a comprehensive uh, analysis of uh, the possibilities in terms of uh, what impact is going to have in what in sectors, uh, economic considerations, et cetera, et cetera. So the committee provides an independent advice. So uh, that is the task of this committee, which is uh, created by this law. So I believe that uh, the fact that you have a, an independent body of experts providing advice on the best way to advance a roadmap, combined with uh, the clear commitment to, to uh, multi-annual carbon budgets is very effective. Uh, but also uh, more recently, uh, what the UK has done uh, has been to convene a, a citizens assembly on climate change to further inform government action uh, towards the, the carbon neutrality that had been adopted for the year 2050 in the realization that uh, well uh, let's say for now i think all over the world we are we have started to pick the lower hanging fruit in terms of uh, climate objectives 
it's true that uh, some countries are being very ambitious, but if you pay a closer look, the ambition is mostly for the midterm. So in the short term, when you look at, uh, say, the, the level of greenness or climate friendliness of uh, the, the recovery efforts uh, across the world after the pandemic, they leave quite a lot to be desired. So uh, the ambition in the short term is not that there, uh, which means, suggests, indicates that uh, there are some practical challenges to increasing ambition quite as fast as is necessary. And probably part of the challenges, apart from technical ones, are political ones. In other words, we are getting now into the zone of taking perhaps not so popular measures, measures that are going to be increasingly disruptive of business as usual. And in every transition, in every change, there are winners and losers, at least in the short term, particularly if a policy is not well designed and if the sensitivities of the, the disadvantage are not taken into consideration. So to address this problem, uh, to, to build this political space and to take, uh, to take the views of the people that will live through these policies and uh, into consideration, there were six committees of the UK Parliament, the six most uh, concerned with climate change, so agriculture, energy, infrastructure, transport, etc. And they collectively uh, convened an assembly of citizens that was sitting uh, for six months in which the citizens re received advice, uh, structured advice from the best experts that, uh, that money can buy and that the UK uh, knowledge the community can provide uh, as to how to achieve the carbon neutrality objectives uh, and across a number of scenarios and then test what policy options would be more or less uh, desirable and accepted by the people. So a very comprehensive report and the, the assembly sat through each of the policy areas. This was a quite grueling exercise that consumed the weekends of over 100 people for six months. They participated voluntarily. And it's important to say that uh, the, the sorting of the people was uh, quite a sophisticated exercise to make sure that absolutely every constituency possible in the UK was somehow represented. And the citizens uh, had an opportunity to, to, uh, to, to make questions to the experts. And so every policy option was debated with quite a lot of granularity. So the result of this is that uh, these six committees received a, a quite bulky report, which take, it's, a, it's a snapshot of the, of the societal preferences and sensitivities as to how to achieve the carbonization on these major sectors of the UK economy. So, and Carl, this- can you quickly capture yeah. the final? I'm done. Can, That's it. Uh, okay. So, so great, thank you. No, you were great, um, but we do we are running on time, and we do have a few others who wish to um, ask some questions. But I, I think what you've also been saying is that these are reports that can also be accessed and also can be read. So that is so great. Um, I just want to make mention that Senator Katia from Brazil and the member from the Chamber of Deputies, Ivan Flores from Chile, have left, the, have left the room. However, if you do have a question for them, you can place it in the chat. And that question, of course, is going to be forwarded to them. Um, I now call on MP Arling Alonso from Nicaragua. You have your hand up. Um, Arling Alonso, and could you unmute? Great. Go right ahead, Arlene. Eh, muy buen día. Eh, realmente... uh, good morning. Well, from the Assembly of Nicaragua, we would like to acknowledge and congratulate this effort that Parla Americas is doing on putting together this report because it is visibilizing or it makes visible what the effort of each one of the parliaments have been so far in order to respond at the national level to this issue of climate change. I would like to comment on just one thing, just for us to think about. I think that it is key for us to think as parliamentarians that we play a key role, a belligerent role within this process because we have come to a conclusion that it's impossible that only one commission, one environmental commission or committee may generate a true, inclusion, a true inclusion when drafting bills, when drafting the annual legislation in a country. It is essential that we all work together and we all are creative so we can have a model 
that actually allow all of the different permanent commissions become guarantee, a guarantee for all of these policies. And so we are all active and we can actually generate a change and we can actually find actions, projects, initiatives that can actually reflect or be seen in the day-to-day -day life of our people. So with this reflection, we have worked to actually incorporate the total amount of parliamentarians in our country in order to incorporate their insights and to see how they can um, take on this drafting of bills. But we have not only incorporated the environmental approach, but also the intercultural and the gender approach and the intergenerational uh, approach. And I would also like to, to share with you that regarding the intercultural incorporation, we have achieved recently, thanks to a collaborative initiative, we have managed to translate our, juridic, our, our legislation into native languages. So these laws, these guidelines, or these regulations are accessible to people from having different languages. So here in this new legislation, we're including this environmental approach. And here we can show them how we are fighting together to address this climate change and to see what the effects of this climate change uh, is going to have on us. So this is pretty much uh, a call for all of us. We must be very careful with this report because thanks to this, we are going to get to know the experiences of different parliamentarians and to see how we can actually work together and how we can replicate some of these aspects. But I think that it, we have had very important advances and we're very thankful for this exchange of knowledge. Thank you very much. Thank you for that contribution, uh, Member of Parliament Arlene Alonso from Nicaragua. And I think we have Member of Parliament Daniela Villar from Argentina who had up their hand. Um, Daniela? Thank you, Caroline. Hola a todos y a todas. La verdad uh -huh. que... Thank you very much. Uh, it is very interesting to to have joined this this summit today to have heard most of the parliamentarians i truly appreciate this these gatherings where we can debate on issues that are important to all of us i would like to say that from our block or from our political space uh, within the congress of the republic of argentina we have had or we have developed some strategies in order to initiate this this scenario that you have already mentioned this journey that we know is going to be difficult but we know that it's a journey that has to be sustainable at least from our perspective but we would i would especially um highlight some of the key aspects that i know have been debated in most of the countries or that i know that are going to be discussed in most of the countries for example the energetical transition. We're working at the moment in our country from our office in things like the production of clean energies, lithium for batteries, and of course, the transition towards hydrogen. We understand that hydrogen is a source of clean energy that is a more, uh, that is safer and more secure. And that for our countries is a unique opportunity to be uh, sovereign in this aspect. In this aspect. And we know that this is part of this environmental proposal that we need to discuss because it also opens up the way for imports with an added value. And we can also generate more quality of uh, job offerings. So we should have in mind this perspective. Whenever we're talking about climate change, we are also talking about inclusion. As we were, as Maximo Guichard, we're talking about the different strategies, the environmental strategies with people included. So people must be included at all times. We're also working in the gradual transition of our food chain and here, so this has to be more hegemonical. And here we're with the Ministry of Technology and the agricultural sector and the Ministry of Agriculture, we have a very ambitious project 
where we have worked in a very collaborative way, where we can see what the transition towards agroecology. We understand that this is a process that takes time. And this is something that we know have many issues at hand, but we hope to be able to work on that. And we hope to actually have all of these specific necessary things in order to open up the way for to establish these discussions. We know that this has to be a joint effort because we know that this transition towards a more sustainable model has to include the civil society participation. Some of the legislators mentioned how the Escazú agreement. And we know that this is part of the Escazú agreement. So that's why our parliamentary, our legislator chamber has launched the environmental forum. And this was a proposal, this was a strategy or a tool because this is a tool, a participatory tool so we can participate on this paradigm in order to co-build a popular agenda or a common agenda where we put together all of the different bills or all of the different bill projects where we may have this discussion between um, the public officers and the cooperators or the different associations that we have or some people coming from native peoples or different representatives from different parts of the society so all of this discussion, it is going to be split in four different axes where we have the environmental ordering as food sovereignty and the just, just transition and the employment, which I think is a problem that, you, that we all are facing in each one of our countries. And within each one of these axes, we have participatory tables or round tables where we start these discussions. The idea is to open up the way in order to discuss what the environmental impact may have specifically with youth, with young people, which I think is something that we have already mentioned here. And of course, we need to have in mind within this context, because we are part of this parliamentary space, we cannot forget about the geopolitical discussion because we are close to celebrating our 26th and anniversary on climate change. And we do know what our role is in the south part of, uh, of the globe. We know what the crisis effects might be. And most of these uh, results are shared among the different countries. But there is also a difference between the among the way that we face these different challenges. So we know that uh, the developed countries can emit even more gases than some other countries. So we need to have, we need to be mindful of what their commitment is because we need to guarantee how the resources are going to be used. So the most vulnerable countries can actually have some mitigation plans. So I think that this is a debate that is quite open that we need to undertake and that we need to have, of course, we need to discuss what the compensation for the ecosystem countries is and how we can exchange this debt or how this debt has to be discussed. And I know that there are different spaces where we can discuss this. Of course, from our global south, there are different commitments that we need to undertake. And we know that we need to discuss this with the most industrialized countries, because as we know, they are the ones that are contributing the most to this climatic crisis. And in financial terms, we need to understand what our commitments are, and having in mind the ecological debt and the environmental debt. So I think that those are the key aspects to have in mind in order to have a more fair or a more just system where we guarantee a transcendental idea, which is the diminishing poverty and inequalities. We know the environmental problems actually exacerbate these kind of problems but they make it worse, especially for the most vulnerable populations. So we hope to be able to contribute with different tools and to be able to work in, in order to help the social justice and of course the environmental justice. Again, thank you very much for opening up the spaces for this kind of uh, gatherings. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniela from Argentina. And so we are going to have two 
two um, final um, interventions and um, comments, questions. Um, one coming from Senator Jorge Eduardo Londona from Colombia, and thereafter from Senator Rene um, Cormier from Canada. And so we'll start with Senator Jorge Eduardo Londona. Eh, muy buenos días aquí en nuestra patria. Good morning from Colombia. And um, let me extend my greetings to all of the different parliamentarians from this uh, climate change uh, network at Parla Americas. Within this context that we have today at hand, we have that is a problematic context, and it has to do with the discussion between the formal democracy and the real democracy. From the formal point of view, we could say that we have a big code of natural resources. I think that it's one of the most complete ones that we have that have been legislated over where we have discussed things about climate change and everything that has to do with the compliance with the Paris Agreement and some other agreements that have been celebrated. But a reality is a problematic real reality and it's kind of chaotic because our national government is convinced that by having the economical recovery has to be based upon this ex extractionist uh, approach that is affecting many of the Latin American countries. So we are having this discussion on fracking. Of course, we are against fracking and we are against um, glyphosate use uh, for uh, in order to put an end to the illegal crops. And above all, we are against and we're very concerned about the more than more than 700 environmental leaders that have been killed in our country ever since 2016. Most of these leaders are environmental leaders that have died defending or advocating for the environmental issues. That's why I think it's important that collectives such as the one that we are in today within this platform we can actually understand and we can receive some support to to face this tough situation that we are living with our social leaders and our environmental leaders. If it is true that, as we say, at least publicly, publicly speaking, our president supported Escazú, it was not um, it was not reflected in the legislative system. As you, so it was not possible to to approve this Escazú agreement. So this is, let's say, a bit of a line approach because it was not accepted by most part of our Congress people. So this makes us think on what the role of the parliamentarians should be, or at least in our country and in many of the Latin American countries should not be a, a task of producing laws or producing legislation or drafting bills, but we need to work on the values in such a way that we can actually make all of this legislation to come true in all of those different aspects. If it is true that in our Senate, in our parliament, as part of the fifth uh, chamber, we have worked with the reforestation processes or taxes to carbon production or different kind of initiatives that have to do with energetical transition that we want to undertake in our country uh, thanks to different agreements or if we criticize this massification process with the gas production where we don't have uh, gas production but for only nine years if it is true that all of this is important it is also important that as environmentalists we must advocate the humankind pr preservation in this planet so we think it is key to pay attention to all of the different human rights problems that are on the foundation of the environmental advocacy. 
because of course we know that we have seen some decrease on this kind of civil society participation because of course they are afraid as i told you with different initiatives with fracking or the glyphosate use they are not willing to participate because they're afraid for their own lives so this makes us think about the real democracy and the form of the democracy we are just expecting what's coming next and of course we hope this collective this kind of initiatives continue to happen and hopefully our contribution uh, can help you out as well thank you very much thank you thank you very much for that intervention senator londona from colombia and we're now i now call on senator rene comir from canada and even though I had said only two more, I'm going to add Senator Winston Gara away from Grenada, and then we will close off this um, open dialogue. So over to you, Senator René, come here. Merci, merci beaucoup, Madame. Je vais m'adresser à vous en français, et je désire euh, féliciter et remercier les interprètes pour leur travail formidable. Je voudrais simplement euh, apporter euh, un I'm élément de réflexion complémentaire. French, and I would like to thank all of the interpreters for the magnificent work they're doing. So I would like to reflect upon one additional aspect that has to do with all of the cultural differences that have been sharpened within our countries and to have in mind the difference in our cultures that we have in each one of our countries, which is key because all of these cultural differences have to do with the way that we address the climate change, either it is in the rural sector or any other kind of sector, and especially for the different kind of sectors and the different kind of generations. How do we establish these kind of conversations and how can we raise awareness regarding their creations? So how can governments support this specific cultural sector in order to achieve our climate objectives. I see that there are many cultural policies may ha must have in mind all of this cultural aspect in order to see how can we affect and how can we reach even more and more people and how can we protect biodiversity in each one of our countries, especially as UNESCO had said, and I exhort you and I encourage you to keep on working in spaces such as this one, which I think it's quite inspirational. And thank you very much for your very rich um, insights. And I hope you have a very good day today. Thank you very much, Senator René Cormier, very short and brief. Thank you. And now I call Senator Winston Garaway from Grenada for the intervention. Senator? Thank you, Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And I, I do appreciate your, your graciousness in uh, accepting me just after the bell would have rang. <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs> um, I, I firstly would like to um, congratulate Pan, Pan Americas for this excellent session today. And um, we do all understand the, the time and the season that we are living in and the effects of climate change and the horrors that it has been causing on most of our member states. And um, the unfortunate thing, though, some of our developing states, small island developing states, are mm, less. We all, the amount of greenhouse gases that we emit are so negligible. But unfortunately, the impact that we receive as a result of the, the storms and the hurricanes that we are facing at this point in time is so gigantic compared to our, our, our carbon footprint. But be that as it may, we have a responsibility and we all do. And I share the sentiments that have been um, presented today. And the role that we have to play in continuing our advocacy for um, the emitters, big emitters, to commit to, to zero emission by 2050. That is extremely important. If we have to survive 
we, within this harsh reality that we are faced with. Um, all countries also should commit to the zero carbon emission um, economy. We have to push ahead with this and a small island development state. We need to push towards to that reality. Um, developing countries should have access to resources to make the, the transition because to move from economies that have been heavily based on fossil fuel into to greener energy, that transition is, is, is a significant investment and we need the necessary support towards making this happen. Um, from a Grenada context, from 1994, our um, lone power purchasing plant was a monopoly. One major foreign investor had significant um, shares in this in this oper operation. Um, unfortunately, though, the share purchase agreement that would have established that monopoly in 1994 primarily gave everything to the, this, this foreign entity. So in terms of power generation, distribution, the government basically had no say. In 2016, with support from the World Bank, and it was a original project, it's a project, the move was made to liberalize the sector and Grenada in 2016 passed the legislation towards that effect. So a new Electricity Supply Act was established. And um, as a result, that would have triggered a number of things. As I've said before, the share purchase agreement that was given to this monopoly in 1994 suggested, or not suggested, but documented that in the event of any one of those happenings, it could have been a natural event where the majority of the assets would have been blown down if there was a hurricane, that could trigger a repurchasing event, meaning that the government will have to repurchase the shares of the company. And if anything would have been done towards affecting the profit margin of this company, could trigger a repurchasing event. So the 2016 Act or the New Electricity Supply Act was constituted as or viewed by the company as a repurchasing event and the, the country was taken to the to exceed the international code for investment um, settlement of in investment dispute and true to form it was viewed as a repurchasing event and the government was placed in a very untenable position to repurchase an asset um over 60 million us dollars we have so moved to towards settling the, the, that investment dispute. And as a result of this, we are now able as a government to move aggressively ahead with our green energy agenda. So the Public Utilities Regulatory Commission at this point in time are able to do the work that it's supposed to do in helping the country to adhere to the Paris Accord um, in ensuring that our greenhouse gas emission is lowered and we move towards a 1.5 degrees Celsius um, economy or a world, as we would say. And to achieve this, what the PUC is doing at this point in time, it's to create an avenue for independent power producers to get into the renewable market and also sell generators. So homeowners are able to do this. Um, before that was not possible, but it is not possible. We've also been able to, to access some grant funding and look at vulnerable families and to give them the, uh, the ability to have their own little self-generating facility through solar, solar panels and so forth. So they're able to power their own home, but most importantly, give them the opportunity to, to power some form of investment plan. So they are being able, cottage industries and so on, they can make some resources for themselves to better the situation. That is extremely important. And the other thing that I want to, to speak to is the mere fact that given that as a 
as a small island developing state, we have been very, very um, conscious of our role within the region towards ensuring that not only are we able to satisfy the requirements of IRENA and, and other agencies as it relates to reducing our greenhouse emissions, but we've been able to work along with a number of agencies towards that effect. The point I want to push here is ensuring that our, our national determined contributions, we have been able to provide, uh, well, we have completed our second um, update of, the, of our NDCs. We are well on the way towards ensuring that um, we have a national infrastructure to monitor and to do the necessary reporting for this. The, the point here is we accept our responsibility very seriously and we are doing everything that is possible to ensure that we reduce our carbon footprint. And that is a message you want to leave. We have seen the devastating effect on the last three years with hurricanes within the region. Whatever we can do towards minimizing that, it is in our best interest. And we want to welcome everyone to get on board to ensuring that we reduce our carbon footprint. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks very much. Thank you, Senator Garraway. And as I close this session, I just want to quickly leave with you a, a little initiative we have in our parliament today, which is to strengthen our oversight and line acting role and responsibility in delivering on this global commitment and of course our national um, development goals. We recently organized an engagement between the UN country team and our parliamentarians. And we felt it was important to elevate amongst our parliamentarians awareness of the commitments, the global commitments and the instruments that detail these commitments. This was the first of its kind in Belize, it has never been done, and we, but we felt that it was necessary to do this since at least 50% of our parliament are new members and most of those returning um, were not part of the parliament when many of these agreements were signed and ratified. And this also created an opportunity for parliamentarians to appreciate the key development challenges that we face, the interrelatedness of these challenges, and basically their implications to environmental, social, and economic resilience of Belize. This really started a conversation for us as to how parliament can shape and influence climate action for low carbon development pathways, while at the same time delivering on our global commitments and achieving our national development goals. Our planned next step is the formation of a joint parliamentary committee on climate change and sustainable development to deliver on this. Again, like I said, this has never been done. It's the first time. So exchanges like these certainly provide us with a wealth of information to calibrate the journey of that joint parliamentary committee in terms of moving forward. So I want to say in closing that to thank Parla Parla for creating these platforms for exchanges on issues of not only national, but global concern. Thanks to all our panelists and the parliamentarians who have shared their experiences during this session, um, the, it was so enjoyable. Um, I was moderating, but I was enjoying the conversation. And Alicia, I turn it over to you. I've survived my first moderation of a Parl America's seminar exchange platform. Thank you, Alicia. Thanks, Parl America's. Well, thank you uh, to our wonderful moderator. We were so very lucky to have you here today, Madam President. Um, Wonderful. Look, we are behind time. So I will rush us through now the final parts of this meeting because I do know you're all very busy. Although behind time means that the dialogue was rich. And, <laughs> and I know we could always do more time with this. I'm going to move us into the reading of the declaration um, because this is the part that's very important. A declaration uh, is developed out of our gatherings. We have been working on this declaration now uh, and, and negotiating it with the different parliaments. Um, and so I guess without further ado, we would like to read it here uh, in order for us to adopt the declaration. So I would like to now, I guess I'm a little bit lost on who I'm in, inviting, I think to start with, because it starts in Spanish. So I think I have my colleague from Nicaragua 
uh, the la diputada uh, Arling Alonso, uh, if she would like to come and uh, start us off in the reading of the declaration in Spanish. Claro que sí, con mucho gusto. Gracias. Quinto encuentro de la red parlamentaria de cambio climático de Parlamérica. Fifth gathering of the network of Parlamericas, tackling on equality to foster the climate ambition, a just transition to reach the Paris Agreement. 4th, 15th and 25th of June of 2021 virtual sessions. We parliamentarians from 22 countries in the Americas and the Caribbean met virtually on June 4th, 15th and 25th of 2021 with the support of the Parliament of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago and the Senate of Mexico for the fifth gathering of the Parliamentary Parliamericas Parliamentary Network on Climate Change entitled Addressing Inequalities to Enable Climate Ambition a just transition to achieve the Paris Agreement. The meeting allowed participants to hold fruitful exchanges, which included a dialogue with representatives of civil society and youth organizations on the importance of developing inclusive and democratic short and long-term climate plans that incorporate intersectional, intercultural and gender based approaches to promote a just transition to zero emission and resilient circular economies. In this sense, a just transition is a response to climate change and the necessary transformations required to mitigate and adapt to its effects aims to plant and invest in the creation of environmentally sustainable and social inclusive jobs sectors and economies. The dialogues revealed that as more than five years after the adoption of the Paris Agreement, and in light of the public health and socioeconomic consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic, it is imperative that efforts to increase the ambition of nationally determined contributions are augmented and accelerated, including strategies to guarantee just transition and meet the goals to move towards sustainable economies that favor the well being of people and communities, particularly those that have been historically marginalized and affected by systemic inequalities, as well as the protection of the environment. Taking into account the above and recognizing one, that as established by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, Climate IPCC on its acronym in English, the climate change constitutes a global emergency that crosses national borders, which is why coordinated solutions are needed at all levels, including through international cooperation to move towards economies with low greenhouse gas emissions as described in the Paris Agreement. Two, the fight against climate change implies a transformation away from current production and consumption models towards more sustainable, socially just developments that favors resilient economies and with low emission of carbon, promoting a just transition along with the green work are uh, decent and quality green jobs. Three, that climate science and scientific data are essential for informed decision making and for the design of evidence-based national climate commitments to meet the Paris Agreement. Thank you very much, Diputada. Muchas gracias. I would now like to invite Senator Anthony Vieira of Trinidad and Tobago to carry on in the reading of the declaration in English. And to remind colleagues, if you would like to follow the declaration, the link is in the chat and you can read it there. Senator Vieira. Thank you. That there are international and regional agreements and mechanisms to guide climate action, including the Paris Agreement, the Gender Action Plan, the Escazú Agreement, the Sen Lisha Agreement, the Salisha, the Sendai Ag Framework, the 2030 Agenda, the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification, 
the Convention on Biological Diversity, as well as the Conference of the Parties, COP, which the 26th edition to be held in November 2021 will be preceded by the pre-COP 26 that will feature a youth summit to elaborate concrete proposals on topics that affect the negotiation process for COP 26. Five, that despite the efforts made by our countries to mitigate the effects of climate change, it is necessary to increase climate ambition and financing to meet the goals set forth in the Paris Agreement and prevent the global average temperature from exceeding the 1.5 Celsius degree compared to pre-industrial levels, an occurrence of, would, that would have catastrophic consequences, according to warnings from the IPCC report on global warming of the 1.5 degrees Celsius. Six, that is referenced in the Paris Agreement, climate action and the impacts of climate change are intrinsically linked to poverty eradication and equitable access to sustainable development. Seven, that people who suffer from social, economic, ethnic, and gender inequalities are especially vulnerable to climate change, and that it is essential to incorporate intersectoral, intersectional, intercultural, and gender approaches to prevent undesirable effects from the implementation of climate policies that may aggravate these inequalities. Eight, that is referenced in the Intergovernmental Declaration on Children, Youth and Climate Action adopted at COP25. Children and adolescents face heightened and specific risks due to climate change and that their demands and proposals for urgent and immediate action to mitigate its effects should be reflected in the climate plans of our governments. Nine, that the necessary transition to decouple emissions from economic growth is a process that requires the creation of new industries, new green and decent jobs, as well as new public and private investments to promote inclusive and resilient green economies. 10, that it is necessary for our government's climate plans to incorporate policies for a just and democratic transition that establish the necessary conditions for transformations towards zero emission economies, strengthen social protection systems, and ensure opportunities and quality jobs for formal and informal workers. 11, that the action for climate empowerment approach present in the Paris Agreement and in the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change offers a comprehensive framework for education, training, social awareness, access to information, citizen participation, and international cooperation, which are fundamental aspects for empowering citizens in their commitment to climate action. 12, the taking into account that most greenhouse gas emissions have historically originated in developed countries and that consequently, the countries least responsible for contributing to climate change are being disproportionately affected by its impacts. It is necessary that the principles of common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capacities are respected and recognized. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Vieira. Et maintenant, je vais inviter député Simon Pierre Savard Tremblay du Canada pour continuer en français. Vas-y. Merci. Alors, nous nous engageons à. Thank you. We commit to incorporate intersectional, intergenerational, intercultural, and gender approaches into our legislative work to ensure that the environmental and climate policies and plans are inclusive and respond to the multiple inequalities that affect the most vulnerable. 
vulnerable populations in a way that complies with the spirits of the 2030 agenda of leaving no one behind and ensures that the costs and benefits associated to the policies are equitably shared. To work on the national promote a crucial dialogue between elements that works with the needs of uh, elements that are inclusive. Second, promote social dialogue between government companies, unions and workers so that they reach the necessary consensus to establish the national policies uh, and the formation on the sector that are working, on the social protection measures and safeguards the labor rights of the affected population. Fourth, encouraged incorporation of the perspectives, needs, and traditional knowledge of indigenous people and Afro descendants in climate plans and um, promote processes of dialogue and consultation in relation to the well being of different traditionally marginalized elements. on the Afro-descendant incidents and descendants of people under colonial servitude systems, members of the LGBTI community and displaced persons and migrants in the context of efforts to mitigate the effects of climate change. Ensure follow-up on political oversight of the design and implementation of the binding commitments signed by our government in the Paris Agreement and national determined contributions, making certain that they have the necessary budget allocation and ensuring that they are ambitious, developed in a participatory manner, include plans for just for a just transition and take into consideration the impact on different population groups. Merci, uh, Deputy uh, Savat Rambley. And now, uh, Deborah Novaj uh, from Parlo Americas to finalize the reading in Portuguese. Great. Incentivar nossos governos a tomar as iniciativas diplomáticas necessárias para garantir o cumprimento da meta coletiva definida na COP21 pelos países desenvolvidos de mobilidade. The compliance of different works on the work that have mobilized to work with different countries to uh, reach the uh, mitigation of proposals with the Paris Agreement in accordance with the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities referenced in Article 2. Seven, promote implementation of the action for a climate empowerment approach and fostering the creation of spaces for citizen participation in the discussion of issues related to the fight against the effects of climate change, ensuring legal framework for access to information on climate change and urging our governments to strengthen our education and public awareness on climate change and its effects. Fostered integration of gender and human rights perspectives in climate plans and include just transition strategies that contain measures to raise labor standards for jobs in which women are often, often underrepresented, such as the care economy. Nine, foster the uh, development of macroeconomic, industrial, and labor policies that promote public and private investment in environmentally sustainable sectors and generate decent jobs throughout the production chain urge our governments to incorporate sustainable development, circular economy, and just transition approaches into macroeconomic plans, growth policies, and post-COVID-19 recovery plans. 11, emphasize the importance of establishing and strengthening institutional and technical capacities at the regional and local levels to drive efforts towards a just transition with the understanding that decentralized responses that recognize the socioeconomic particularities of local communities are required. 12, encourage our governments to sign the Declaration on Children, Youth and Climate Action and implement the commitments therein particularly with regard to establishing formal and periodic spaces for the participation of children and young people in decision-making processes related to climate, including their political participation through political parties and legislative processes, and incorporate their perspectives and contributions in the implementation of the Paris Agreement and in the processes of updating the national determined contributions. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Colleagues, this is the declaration that has been drafted to culminate the uh, work that has been done over the month of June at Parliamericas with the parliaments, our member parliaments from the countries across the Americas and the Caribbean. You have in the chat a document uh, that you will have been following through this reading. We thought it was very important to make sure we read the declaration in Parliamericas for um, official languages for the inclusion of all of our membership. I would like to now um, open uh, to, uh, to adopting this declaration. It has been uh, negotiated through uh, representatives from the various parliaments over the time. However, if at this point there is something that someone would wish to raise, uh, a, a point of consideration on the declaration, or I'm opening the floor to see if we can move to adopt this uh, this declaration. Senator Rosa Galvez, I see your hand. I move the adoption of the declaration. Oh, thank you, Senator. All right, well then, if I see no, no one asking for the floor, we're ready to move it. If we could just see a show of hands, it's the best way I can say that we're moving, moving this. If you could turn on your camera for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Vieira. I see hands up, virtual hands as well. Thank you, Senator from, yes, Tamel from Trinidad and Tobago. See, si, uh, uh, Senator De Vesquez. Muchas gracias. Thank you, everyone. A month of law hard work complete, but all of our work not finished. I know this declaration will help guide our parliaments um, uh, moving forward on this agenda. I will now move us to the next point in our agenda, which is actually just to announce the election uh, results. As you know, Parliamericas maintains a, um, a, a network, the parliamentary network, uh, Parliamericas for climate change or on climate change. And, and with that, the network is actually run by a committee from of parliamentarians. And this year we have the opportunity to uh, engage a new group of parliamentarians into the network as a part of that executive committee. So without further ado, I will an announce the results of the election. So you are aware of who are our next members of this committee. So the vice presidency uh, for the network from North America will be Senator Raul Bolaños, Cacho Quay of Mexico. Um, the vice president of, for the network from Central America, we are very excited to welcome back a member of the Legislative Assembly, Paula Vega of Costa Rica. For the vice presidency uh, from South America, we have two. In fact, we have the first vice president will be the member of the National Assembly, Luis Bruno Segovia of Ecuador. And the second vice president will be member of the National Assembly. I am so sorry, Rajendra Koimer Debbie. Mr. Debbie, I apologize if I got your name. You'll have to teach me how to pronounce it correctly. So I'm looking forward to working with you. And then for the vice presidency for the Caribbean, we are delighted to have Senator Anthony Vieira of Trinidad and Tobago. Those are our vice presidents. And the new president, who is moving from vice presidency to the presidency, I'm very excited to say we have Senator Rosa Galvez of Canada, who will be taking over the presidency of the network. Um, so a round of applause to all of our executive committee. Lots of work to do together. Lots of work to continue to lead this important work at Parliamericas. With that, I am going to now then move us into uh, the closing of the session. I would like to invite Senator Rosa Galvez, our new president of the Parliamentary Network for Climate Change to take the floor and deliver some closing remarks. Senator Galvez. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, where is my, okay, thank you so much, Alicia. Um, ante todo, me gustaría agradecer al person Above all, I wanted to thank all the staff of Parliamericas. That they have done, everything that they have done, have gone, up and beyond for a productive encounter. Again, thank you so much, Alicia, Annabella, Emily, Maria, Alvaro, Jack, Caroni, and Deborah for coordinating this event and taking us to this valuable discussion between parliamentaries of all Americas. 
I would like to uh, also to give my utmost thanks to the president of the Senate of Mexico, Honorable Eduardo Ramirez, and the representative that has been with us today, and the representative of the Chamber of Representatives of Trinidad and Tobago, uh, BJ Bridget Anisette George, for being the uh, host of this meeting, and a special thanks to all our parliamentary colleagues and all the different assistants that have participated in the work of the last weeks. Uh, when I started my mandate as the new president of the Parliamentary Network of Climate Change, I would like to acknowledge the importance of the work that has been done by the former president, by Mrs. Anna Belen Marine from Ecuador, and the vice president, uh, Honorable Andy Daniel from Santa Lucia, St. Lucia, and Jennifer Simons from Suriname. So to wrap up, I would like to give a welcome to our newly appointed vice president, Mr. Raul Volanios Cadraquez from Mexico, Deputy uh, Paula Vega, Deputy uh, Jean Segovia from Ecuador, Deputy Jajandra and Nicomar Devi from Suriname. Uh, if I had it wrong, I'm deeply sorry. Uh, Senator Anthony from Trinity and Tobago, Trinidad and Tobago, I'm sure that we are going to create a great and solidarity team, highly collaborative and highly efficient as well. These last weeks, we have tackled the factor of inequality and how we can handle, we can handle this properly so that in a way or another, this can help us to foster, to have a large uh, climate ambition, because this is the key factor to have uh, success in our defense and in our adaptation towards the negative impact of climate change. There are also opportunities, and for the same reason, we have to be aware, keenly aware, uh, on on the, the opportunities. So this challenge is global, and these affects all and everybody and everything. However, they impact a lot more negatively, some more than others, especially the vulnerable communities and the marginalized communities as well. The cost in health for these uh, will go in a disproportionate manner on groups that have been structurally oppressed like the indigenous people, women, elders, uh, youth, and uh, disabled people, as we have heard often. So it's also an aftershock and something that has happened with colonial and patriarchal elements that are still linger on in many parts of America and that we have to lessen and correct. Facing the biggest challenge of human history, but our generation, which is in power, also have the knowledge and the understanding of the consequences and the causes for this havoc. More than what previous generation um, had. We also know that we have the technological tools and also the means to act. So Taz, I am hopeful, there is hope. And we want to remember us, you and me, all of us, as the generation that was brave, that took the right decisions and acted accordingly for the well being of next generations, which are those of our own children and the children of our children. When the world gathered to ratify the Paris Agreement, we witnessed a level of international collaboration that desperately was in need to fight climate change. Since then, several countries have committed to net zero greenhouse gas emission by or at the latest or before 2050, a crucial action if we are to limit the global warming to 1.5 degrees, because we know that it will be tragic to humanity if we exceed those limits. Only a few countries have already adopted climate accountability legislation to achieve this. And I am the proud sponsor to the Canadian climate accountability legislation that we hopefully and praying will be adopted next week.
I encourage every parliamentarian to find the right solutions to keep our government accountable to our international commitments for the good of our planet, but also for the good of everybody and, and not as the life that we know in this planet. I look forward to starting my work as president of the Parliamentary Network on Climate Change to work with you all on improving legislation on environmental protection in the Americans. Ours is a network of sharing knowledge, experiences, and ideas. Let's help each other. Finally, our defense and adaptation facing climate change has a direct link with the two other pillars of Parliamericas, which are open parliaments and gender equality. As every government in the world is raising their climate ambition and promising billions of dollars to find climate solution, we need a clean recovery after the pandemic. We need a just transition. We need transparency, accountability, and proper management more than ever before in human history. Or democracy history. We need to ensure that our efforts benefit us all, not just the wealthy, not just the privileged. Also, reducing gender inequality increases the general well-being of our population and reduces the disproportionate impacts of climate change. Only through holistic and intersectional approaches will be able to efficiently address all the above mentioned issues. Thank you again for your devotion to our peoples, to your country, to the Americas, and to our planet. This has been a wonderful and very productive gathering. I wish you great success as we continue pursuing our common goals. Thank you very much. Muchísimas gracias. Me wish. Thank you so much. Thank you, Senator Galvez. Well, we are done. That is today's meeting. Thank you all. That was, um, we are uh, so grateful. These meetings would not be valuable if it weren't for you. I have one last piece of homework for those who are willing to do this for me. As you know, we get our financing for a lot of our activities through the Government of Canada through Global Affairs Canada. So before you leave, if you can do me a favor and complete the evaluation of the session, this is important data for our work. Uh, for us to report to the donors and to make sure that we can continue to tailor the programming in a way that is valuable to you, the parliamentarians, our stakeholders, our members. So thank you for that. And that's all I have to say. The floor is open for anybody who, if you would like to say anything. It was so delightful to have you all here. Usually we would be eating lunch together now and having a nice chit chat and, and getting to know each other. Soon enough, the pandemic will be over and we can do that again. Ambassador de Alba, again, so lovely to see you, sir. Thank you again for your contributions to our meeting. No, thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. It has been a pleasure. Well then. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Thank you Muchas very much. Todos, que les vaya muy bien. Thank you all. Hope you have a good day. Mm -hmm.